Thank you very much and, and welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, so I want to share with you what we did this past year. So I have to start with a warning that I'm about to show you because this chemistry is uh, new. And so just a little warning that it's what happened in 22. It happened at one location and it's on a single carrot variety. Okay, so just understand that when you uh, look at our data as we go through this. I'd like to acknowledge my co-author Peter Smith for all his great work in helping make this possible. So today we're going to highlight uh, four basic chemistries. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about some of the new chemistries that I think will have a fit um, in the carrot market, both in the near future and in the far future as well. Um, Pyridate, you've all had hopefully some experience that's, that's uh, tough. We had an emergency registration on that before, um, and that we brought in again to focus on the linearon resistant uh, weed problem. So everything that we do is really around that focus about management of resistance. And I just highlight that that's in a, a group six. And so that's pyridate is in the same family as bromoxynil, okay? Uh, which has some interesting connections there. So that's, that's something that we had used. Now, I understand there's nothing commercially available in Ontario now. Uh, it's all out West on chickpeas. But they will be bringing that back to register it in corn. And so at some point, I'm pretty sure we'll get a minor crop registration around that. I'm going to show some data on a completely new chemistry that was tested for the very first year here um, and had some very interesting results. This is uh, metobromuron. It's a product used years ago in white beans. It was called Pateran at the time. And now they're introducing it as a product called Praxim. And it is in the same family as linearon. Now, so I don't know for sure whether it has the same problem linearon has because of that, but it also has some interesting residual characteristics and, and we'll show you that. I'll give some updates on Blazer, um, which is a group 14 herbicide, um, just to show some updates to help improve the efficacy of Blazer on pigweed. And then a brand new chemistry here. This, we started work with this product in 2018. Uh, we tested it this past year up here again, has really interesting selectivity on carrots. And the most exciting thing about that, it's entirely new group of, of uh, mode of action, which would be absolutely critical. Um, we have talked to Bear, this is a product, this is an old product that was used in cereals in Europe and went under different names of Brodol and Convintro. Um, they're looking at registering this product for corn and soybeans in about 2025, okay? So once that happens, then we could start the discussions around uh, some of the minor crop uses. So just some background. So, so as I said about this warning, so this is on one variety, it was Cell a Bunch. Uh, we seeded this in uh, at 25 seeds per uh, 30 centimeters per foot. And it was seeded in the, in the early June, four replications. And so our beds are two rows, 85 centimeters apart, about six meters in length. And we applied our herbicides at a volume of 200 liters per hectare. And then we used the best management practices after that date. So this is typically how our season would begin um, with our, our backpack sprayer. And, and Peter has been instrumental in best design in helping to look after those trials. So I want to begin with pyridate or tough and talk to you what we did to confirm selectivity in carrots. We focused on the very early stages. There were two things I wanted to know. If we used it sort of as, as the stale seed bed before the carrots came up, was there any residual carryover that would cause delay and emergence? Okay, because I'm really sensitive about that. And then the second stage was, how much tolerance do we have in the bunny ear stage of carrots? Okay, and uh, I wanna show you some really, really interesting results with that product. So what does Tuff do? So we were anxious about Tuff because Tuff um, looks after Eastern Black Nightshade. We were most focused on the pigweed story that it could bring, and it also controls lamb's quarters and wild mustard. So as far as a herbicide goes, it's got very, very small uh, spectrum of weeds that, that is, uh, it's on the label. 
And so you really have to think with this product, you know, you have to think small. Everything has to be small. Otherwise, it's going to get away on you. Okay, so that's very central to the use of this product. So we put it on pre, and by pre, I mean, this is sort of the stale seed bed before the carrots are up. And I wanted to confirm that there was going to be absolutely no carryover problems. And here's the rate. So we have a weed-free check. Uh, this is the crop growth stage. So this is like stale seed bed, carrot stand, and yield. So this is the rate that we recommended to you to use when it was on emergency use pattern. That's 450 grams. We took it up to 1200 grams, okay? We just cranked it right up because I want to know if there's a break point, right? Before you guys find that out, okay? Because that's, that's, uh, that's important. So we went from 300 up to 1200. And I just want to highlight that at the end of the day, we did not impact stand or, uh, or yield. So that opens up an interesting play because bromoxenil or partner that you use at this same time is very weak on pigweed. With partner, you have to get pigweed when it's really, really small. You can now start thinking about adding this to the partner, okay? And that will pick up the pigweed control if you had pigweed that emerged prior to the emergence of the carrots, okay? I'm gonna come back to metobromion in a minute but I'll just deal with the pyridate first. And then we put pyridate on at 300 grams up to 1200 again, but we put it on at the bunny ear leaf stage. Can I hurt bunny ears, right? Don't wanna hurt the bunny ears. Um, and I started thinking early on that this would be a very sensitive stage. I thought you gotta be really careful at this stage, be very, very careful about bunny ears. I was surprised at the level of tolerance that it had, okay? Up to 1,200 grams, and yield does, looks a little lower here, but statistically, there was no difference because of the variability in, in harvesting. So at this point, we can say, again, that there was no significant difference in stand or in yield as a result of up to 1,200 grams. So how does that play out, right? It does look to me that if the pigweed was... This is the rate that we first recommended to you. Uh, there are options to apply it more than once in the system or at a higher rate, perhaps. I don't think you wanna be up here, but at a higher rate, if you think the pigweed was, was getting ahead of you a little bit. So some interesting plays that are possible. Now I wanna go back and I wanna show this pattern here. That I call it pattern, excuse me. Uh, Praxum, which is metal bromuron. Again, it's in the same family as linuron. And so we have to, sort that out a little bit. But I was surprised at the length of residual that this demonstrated on high organic soils, okay? And, um, you know, in textbook and teaching, we would teach that organic matter ties up herbicides. But we had herbic we had activity that was, was well beyond my expectations in terms of residual control. So this is a thousand grams. And again, we didn't have any negative effect on uh, crop um, carrot stand or final yield. And then we put it on post at 500 grams and it didn't seem to have any negative activity on, on, the, on the carrot stand or yield as well. So I talked to them about that. Uh, this is Beltram's product. Uh, they are interested in the carrot market when they make that decision for minor crop registration, I'm not sure when that is, but it is definitely something that could be on the radar screen uh, for us as we move into the future. Very interesting, we're gonna be testing that again this year. So I also wanna, then we had another trial and I only put, and it's in the book that is available for you to look at. You can see that all the treatments that we had listed there, um, but I've just pulled out a little bit. What I wanna show you is we took tough. And we wanted to know, could we mix it with the group 15 herbicides like Zidua, um, uh, like Dual, these types of things, and have any, any issues there. So here's pyroxysulfone or Zidua plus Tough applied at the bunny ear to first leaf stage. Uh, we then applied some Blazer, and then we mixed it with Gold. So this picks up, you know, we have these rates here of Blazer and Gold. This helps pick up the pigweed control here. And we did not have a problem if we mixed goal and tough. We had no 
selectivity issues there. And we didn't have any problem if we mixed it with peroxysulfone. And in this case, I just show you that we mixed it with Blazor as well. So when that product gets registered, we have a lot of flexibility to increase our level of pigweed control and also pick up additional spectrum of, of weeds because it can be mixed uh, safely. It appears at this point uh, that it could be mixed with the, the aduls and the peroxysulfones. So we mixed it with Prowl. We did that as well. And but also we can mix with Blazer and, and Goal, which ups the, the control level of those products safely, which is really, really important and good to know. And you can see here again, crop stand and final yields here were all very, very good. Here's prior date at 1200 grams uh, pre. There's that 1200 grams post. And here's metabromia on Pateran um, at 1,000, and there's at 500. So very interesting residual, very interesting. And we'll see again, we'll be testing it this year to see if that holds up. So just to follow up on that metabromia, and this is the spectrum that it has, barnyard grass, green and yellow foxtail, eastern black nightshade, weld mustard, common trickweed, pigweed, Pigweed green, pigweed red, common lambs quarters, groundsel, knotweed, scented, uh, scented mayweed, and shepherd's purse. Very useful for marsh growers, okay, if we can follow up on this and continue to get that type of activity. We're going to be testing it this year to see if it has any post-emergence activity. And this year, it was just simply a pre-herbicide pre first look at it that we tested. So something to uh, hopefully we can uh, see if it works on some um, resistant species as well. So I've got four learning points for you to take away today. Learning point number one, carrots were tolerant to tough, applied pre or early post at one eight year stage at rates from 300 up to 1200. Um, and Praxim, this metal bromion applied pre at 1000 post at 500 uh, did not cause us any problems in 22. Hopefully not in 23 as well. So don't hesitate if you have any questions as we go through. I'm happy to answer questions as we go along. Learning point number two out of those studies, we also learned that we could mix tough, okay? Now the danger here, and this is coming up consistently, is the, the companies kind of want to pre-formulate these things in a set formulation. And it's important that we have flexibility, not only for tank mixtures here, but that we have the product as single products. And there tends to be, the, in some of these products, the tendency to go the other way. We're going to sell a formulated product, and it's not going to be available as a standalone. But look at the with flexibility that tough that this would give us if we have that. Because you have it with Dual, uh, uh, Zidua, Prowl, all applied post. And we applied it at the Codeline stages. And we also applied it at the five to seven leaf stage. And the selectivity was very solid Okay, in 22. I just say that so that you don't chase me off the territory at some point, there's a problem. <laughs> but anyway, and the carrots were tough, then we mix it with blazer. Now, this is interesting because the blazer, we got that registered specifically for pigweed. We had it at a low rate because I was afraid of taking the codlings out, the, the bunny ears out. But now it looks like we could add tough to that. And that makes that combination much stronger on uh, linear on resistant pigweed. And we can also mix it with goal. And that increases the level of control on that. So those are things that would be very encouraging uh, to try and to, to follow up on. Now, the next study that we did that I wanna show you is um, about Blazer. And so I have to admit, I got caught off guard this last spring, okay? This is what we developed in our studies. We said, this is the rate, 18.75 grams. Now, keep in mind, that this product is used in soybeans at 400 to 600 grams active, okay? We're at 18, right? So it's completely different active uh, use of the, the rate here. This is what we uh, developed and said, this is where we should be. This is what we put out, promoted to control small pigweed. When it, got, it came through with a minor crop registration, so this is registered, I jumped because it came through as blazer plus assist at 23 grams active. And 
I had never tested it at that rate. I didn't know where they got that from. So I phoned up Matt and said, you know, like this is be really careful here because I don't know whether this, what this is gonna do. So we scrambled to put in a trial. And um, so this is Blazer by itself. We ended up here, we had no, you know, decent yields here. Blazer plus assist, and we applied a bunny ear to one leaf, seemed to be okay. Then we went to the 23 gram rate. So we've upped the rate here, which should give us more control of the pigweed by itself. And then we added assist to it as well. And we didn't see a problem, which I'm glad to know. So this is like the evolution of how we're using some of the products that we initially developed. And we took this up as high as 50 grams. Now don't do that, okay? Because I was, I'm still a little, a little leery about that. But in 22, we didn't have a problem with 50 grams. What it does indicate is there's some room for movement because I know some of you might have not had the control of pigweed that you thought you might want to have had. And again, I have to stress think small. This is all about small, all about small. But now, so this is where the minor registration lies. And it looks to me that this is gonna be okay, that we can do that, put the assist with it. So not only here do we have an increased rate, we also have the surfactant, which will also help with the activity, okay? So this is something that we can do today, okay? Because some of the things I tell you about, there's always down the road, but this is definitely something that we can do today. And I still wouldn't want to see you go that high, but certainly we can get into this, this market area here. And it would appear to me that it had reasonably good, well, very good selectivity in 22. So there it is there, Blazer Plus Assist of 23 grams. So wherever they got the data for, to do that, it worked, thank goodness, and it wasn't a problem. But I'll tell you, I lost sleep at least a couple nights thinking that I didn't know whether it was gonna work for you or not, it would cause any problems. So learning point number three is that you could, looks like we can up the ante on Blazer a bit. We tested it at these rates and we tested it early for crop selectivity, and we found that it was uh, safe when we did with the oil concentrate that the 23 gram rate worked worked well. So that should help improve your, your selectivity and activity on, uh, on, the, um, not, uh, on the pigweed. Now, I wanna spend a moment on this one because this is an entirely new bit of chemistry. I have talked to Bear, this is by Bear, I have talked to Bear and told them about our need for this chemistry. They are planning on registering this chemistry, as I mentioned earlier, in 2025 for corn and soybeans. And they said in terms of minor crops that carrots are now high on their list of priorities. So this is sometime past 25, okay. But the exciting thing is, there's some good and, new, and some challenging news here is that it's an entirely new group. This would look after a lot of problems. Now this, as I mentioned earlier, was originally, so this is old chemistry. It's being reinvented because of resistance and it's brought back because of its activity on pigweed, particularly these pigweeds here, uh, red, green, and water hemp. This is the big one here in terms of field crops. This is, this is like, uh, it's got resistance to, to six or seven different herbicides, right? So this is a real threat on the field crop side. And certainly we don't want to get this into vegetable production. But it also has some activity on lamb's quarters, ground seal, not, not weed, shepherd's purse. But this is really where this would fit. So the idea here is we would take this novel chemistry and start playing the mixtures with what we use in carrot production. Um, we tested in 2018 and it looked very, very good. Um, and at that time, it was a confidential trial. We could not talk about it. We just wanted to know if we had selectivity because we wanted to argue to them that it could be a fit for carrot producers here in Ontario. And then we tested it again in 22. So this is, I think it's coming out, it's gonna be called um, Husky Pre, I think is the name that I heard, but that may change between then and now, I don't know. So we tested this. Uh, product at uh, 60 grams up to 120 grams at the bunny ear to first leaf stage. 
Okay. And it looked, it had great selectivity on carrots, great selectivity. It's used as a pre-emergence herbicide. And on post-emergence, we went from 60 up to 180. So again, it appears that we have a wide range of dose and selectivity in carrots, which is very, very good, right? Very, very good. So with its, and it's being marketed across, it's been brought from Europe into North America for its pigweed control. And bingo, who needs pigweed control too? The carrot growers in Ontario need pigweed control. So we didn't get any, any significant difference here uh, between the stand count and the yield. And we had similar results in 2018, identical results in 2018. So here's an overview of the plots. This is on Jane Street. Um, this is all put on pre, and we did not have any particular problem uh, with it at all. So if we can get that, that opens up a tremendous amount of new opportunities for carrot growers. The downside, which I just had a discussion with them yesterday, is that they want to bring it into the corn and soybean markets as a pre-formulated mix. In soybeans, it is the, they want to bring it in on soybeans mixed with metribuzin. And they're not sure whether it's going to be a standalone product. So we tried to argue that that would be a great thing to have as a standalone product. So it is possible that it would come in in um, a ratio of one part uh, diflufenican and two parts metribuzin. So that is if we had 60 grams of this diflufenican, you'd have 120 grams active of metribuzin. Now we don't, metribuzin is registered on carrots. It's not a large market share on carrots. There's some sensitivity around that. So that may be the way it gets introduced. We don't know yet, okay? And only time will tell. But anyway, if we can stay on top of that at the minor crop registration meetings and negotiations with the company, uh, no telling where we end up um, as we ha potentially have done with pyroxysulfone. So here again, at these rates, a nice rate range here. Um, it does have some post-emergence activity. We have not tested it post on carrots. It's always been on pre, but I'm told uh, that it will take down um, two to four leaf stage pigweed at a rate of about 60 grams active, okay? So some encouraging things to, to look forward to um, there. Um, and that, if we could tank mix that, that would just fill the pigweed vacuum that we have. And it would just be, you guys be on easy street from there on for a while. So what we did, basically did in 22 was looked at ways to improve what we already knew. We worked with some of the products we already had, and can we improve the level of control that we had with the resistant pigweed species? Now, my goal here now is to try to set up for the next 10 years down the road this coming summer to try to um, try some completely different programs that based on the chemistries that I think are going to work for carrot growing in 2030, 2035, okay? So what we're planning for this summer is we're gonna pick up on this and the one gap that I have that we have to prove yet is that there's no plant back issues, okay? That has not been done. Uh, so we're going to be, that trial that I showed you the picture on Jane Street, we will try it. We're gonna plant that back into onions. And if we have a problem there, well, it's game over, but, I'm hoping that we don't, um, so we will know that. We will confirm this in 2025. Um, and then if that if we don't have a plant back issue with at least onions, um, then we can start to move forward and look forward to when they get it registered in 2025. Now, the other thing that is coming back is this product here. This used to be a Monsanto product, uh, acetochlor, and and acetochlor, again, is old chemistry, which is being reinvented because of resistant problems. So acetochlor is a group um, 15, is, yeah, 15, which is like it's a dual peroxysulfone type compound, okay? So it's in that same grouping, okay? But the reality is that we're going to take a look at that this coming year to see if it has a fit in carrot production much like we did with pyroxysulfone. 
The reason for that is, again, uh, several of the companies have this uh, product and are testing it, but that would be a really good combination and that may come out uh, with, 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 um, with a bear, okay? So we're gonna take a look at that to see if this acetochlor works. We're going to take a look at diflufenican to see if we can tank mix it with some of these other products in particular emphasis around the metribucin. And my final note of the day, um, I'm looking for an on-farm trial where I know, or you know that you do have resistance and it might get a little bit messy, but I just need some a corner. I just have to test a couple of these products to be sure that it works on, uh, particularly the metabromuron uh, on resistant ligeron resistant pigweed. So, if you're willing to give me a, just a little bit of a corner where we could try some of this new groupings and just to take a look if, about activity, that would be great. Otherwise, we'll be running trials here on the station in 2023. With that, I want to say thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions. Thanks, Matt. Well, thanks, Matt. I know we have a we've got questions online. Uh, any questions in the room? Matt, your hand up. Can you go over the water volumes you use for? Uh, we all they're all sprayed about two hundred liters per hectare, which is twenty six gallons per acre. And we, that's we stay at that. And we use the the um, peat, the the nozzles or the low the no drift. Yeah, they're, they're extended range air Yep, we stay with that. That's all we use. Now we haven't done any work. Clearly, some of the you know interest might be in different volumes. Uh, we've not not done any of that work at all. So our goal has been to move this as quickly as we can. So we look at selectivity on the carrots. We look at dose. And then um, that's where, and we're looking to try to get a very narrow registration like on one weed species. So the whole goal is we try to move this as fast as we can so that you can get some of these tools into your hands as quickly as possible. Anyone else? Good boy. The online question is how, how many days before the carrots emerge did you apply this stuff? Oh, um, how many days before? Probably about uh, uh, six by the time we got it down. So you guys planted here, peat came up, sprayed. So if I, if I think about 10 days before they emerge, it'll be right in the middle of that time frame. And then there's a comment, uh, Kristen Obie said they have found watering since in some more crops, including peppers, seed corn, <laughs> and that area. Yeah, lucky us. Yeah. And then also, Wondering why the mix with uh, metric use and there's a significant amount of group five resistant water heads. Uh, bull target site resistance and metabolic resistance. I'm not sure they would add much to the water heads problem. Well, it's going to plug the hole with metribuzin. That's that's how that product's going to be used. It's it's going to go after the water on the field scale level. That's it'll go after. I also don't know whether it has any activity on. Um, on onions, we've never tested it on onions either. So anyway, lots to learn, lots to try on your behalf. Delighted to do that to help support the industry here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Clarence. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Will you be here for a bit? Somebody else has uh, more questions? I will. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> next up, um, I'll be uh, introducing Umbrin. PhD candidate with uh, Mayor Ruth Group, and she's doing some interesting work with um, Cavity Spot. So I'll let you pick first. Good morning. I am Amreen Elias, and I'm a grad student working with Mary Ruth McDonald. That work. Uh, okay. Is that better now? Okay. And uh, my research is. Mainly the main of my aim of my research is to improve the management of cavity spot on carrots. And with this, I'm focusing on two main approaches. The one is disease prediction and the second is disease management. And today I will share with all of you the research progress and the results I have so far. 
All the carrot growers are well familiar with these pictures that these are the Leon's own carrots cavity spot disease. The disease has worldwide distribution and in Canada, this disease has been reported from all carrot production areas annually, but with variable disease pressure. In the Holland Marsh, the most of grower fields have cavity spot in it. The pathogen is soil-borne pythium species. The disease is unusual because it is caused by several species of pythium. And frequently, these six species are associated with the disease. It is interesting to know that the composition of the pythium species which are causing disease, that's the cavity spot, vary with the location. So it's also important to know that which species is causing disease at Holland Marsh because the disease control specifically that the fungicide, Redomil, which is mostly used, varies with the pythium species. For example, pythium sulcatum is relatively less sensitive to Redomil as compared to pythium violet. So we can say that if in a region there is more pythium sulcatum, there is a possibility that the fungicide is going to be less effective as compared to a region which have Pythium volley as an abundant species. The disease has limited management practices, which include avoiding infested field and the long crop rotation up to three to six years. And these long crop rotations are usually not feasible economically. All commercial cultivars are susceptible, but susceptibility varies. There are the three fungicides at Ontario which are registered to manage cavity spot, out of which only one, that's the Redomil, is relatively effective. But the repeated use of this fungicide can lead to fungicide resistance in pathogen and enhance microbial breakdown, which can also result into disease control loss. Now let's talk about the first point that the cavity spot prediction. For this, we are looking to develop a pre-planned soil test to assess the risk of cavity spot in the field. For this, we are focusing on two main approaches. The first one is relating the soil properties and soil microorganism with the disease risk. So the high risk field can be avoided. And the second is to relate the amount of pythium species in the soil before seeding to the disease severity in the mid season or at the harvest. The soil was collected uh, in May, in the late May usually, before seeding or soon after seeding from the fields, which are grouped as low risk and high risk field at the Holland Marsh uh, with the assistance of IPM survey team. These all fields which are uh, included in this study have muck soil, onion carrots in rotation. A few have applied the redomil, the fungicide specific to pythium species. The soil collector was sent to labs for the nutrient analysis and microbial analysis. These are the results from one year, that is 2021. Samples have been sent for the results for this 2022. Here I'm showing only one graph over here and this is showing that here, it is showing that the fungal diversity, that how many different kinds of fungi are present in the soil, especially the soils which are having high risk and low risk. And we measure that as the alpha diversity measure that the index and it's showing that the fields which are having high disease risk this fungal count is up to unit two, but the other one which are having low risk, the fungal count is going up to unit three. So we can say that from this graph, there are the more different kinds of fungi in low risk field as compared to high risk field. Moreover, the results are showing that there are some kind of fungi and bacteria which is more abundant in low risk soil as compared to high risk soil. However, we didn't find any specific trend for umai seeds, which include the pathogen pythium associated towards low risk and high risk soils. 
For the soil nutrient analysis sample collected in 2021 and 2022, the two years data is showing that the low risk soils have relatively lower organic matter, but high pH and high calcium base saturation compared to high risk soils having high organic matter, lower pH and lower calcium base saturation. There is no effect of other nutrients on the disease risk. And from the effect of pH and calcium, the one thing comes in our mind that if increasing calcium or increasing the pH of soil can reduce the disease management. So for this, there are the field trials ongoing at the MUX station. And after my talk, Kevin will talk about this in detail. So I'm not going in detail, but these are the two factors. Uh, we are looking in my research and other field trials at Mux Station. For the disease prediction, low risk soils have comparatively more fungi, more bacteria. Low risk soils have comparatively high soil pH and high calcium content. But there was no difference in pythium communities in low risk and high risk soils. Now come to the second part which is the cavity spot management. The first thing in the management is to confirm the relative susceptibility of commercial carrot cultivars to cavity spot. The second is to identify which pythium species associated with cavity spot lions are present at Holland Marsh and identify that whether they are vary with the cultivar or with the growing season. And the third is to screen the pythium isolates for their resistance to fungicide, that's the radomel. Coming to the first one is the confirming the relative susceptibility of carrot cultivars. These carrot cultivars are categorized into three categories based on the previous research trials. One is relatively resistance, which include the purple haze and deep purple, then moderately susceptible, including most of the carrot cultivars and highly susceptible, including the red colored carrots, atomic red and red sun, and orange colored carrots, the envy and the triton. Field trials have been conducted at the Mud Crop Research Station for three years, and three years of data is showing these results. The disease was assessed at the mid season and also at the harvest that in October. And here I'm showing the results of only 2022, because in the past years, we are having the same result and same trend has been shown. So here we find that the deep purple as expected is the resistant one and having no disease. Compared to this, the carrot cultivars such as sallow bunch and pro peel they have relatively less disease compared to the red sun, which is the most susceptible one. So sallow bunch and propyl are relatively less susceptible compared to red sun. And in the orange carrot cultivar, Envy is the one who has numerically higher disease in all the orange carrot cultivars. The second is to identify which pythium species associated with the cavity spot is abundant or, or present at the Holland Marsh and if they vary. And then the most common species will be tested for their resistance to fungicide, that's the redomil. Pythium species have been isolated from cavity spot lions from th three years, 2020 to 2022. The results of 2021 have shown that all the isolates were only one species that the Pythium sulcata. And in 2021, Pythium isolates were collected from different fields, which are having different cultivars. Some applied mephinoxim, or that's the fungicide specific name, Redomil, and some don't. So in 2021, most of the isolates are once again Pythium sulcatum, only few we find that's the pythium intermedium. The isolate which are collected in 2022, their identification is still going on. But most probably, we find more pythium sulcatum once again. So on base of these results, 
Pythium sulcatum is the abundant species at Holland Marsh, causing cavity spot on carrots. And in several cultivars, we have found the same species is the most abundant one. Come to the third part to screen the Pythium isolates for their resistance to fungicide, that is the Redomil. Now it comes why it is important because the disease control failure using the fungicide started to report in Ontario. So it's important to know that if there is some resistance at Holland Marsh, the isolates, Pythium isolates, the pathogen has been collected from several fields from past three years and then they were screened for the fungicide resistance. That's the Redomil. The results for 2021 is showing that all Pythium isolates were sensitive. In 2022, the isolate tested from seven different fields out of which half of fields have applied mephinoxin. Sorry, that's the radiomel fungicide. All the Pythium isolates were sensitive. In all those fields to which fungicides were applied before, our fungicide wasn't applied. In 2022, the isolates were collected from 12 fields. I have finished testing with two fields only in which one have applied the fungicide and other don't. All isolates are once again sensitive. So the conclusion for this part is, as you all know, purple haze and deep purple least disease, all the commercial carrot cultivar orange colored were susceptible. Atomic red and NV was most susceptible. Sallow bunch and propyl was moderately susceptible to cavity spot. The most abundant species based on the results so far is Pythium sulcatum. And we didn't find any resistance to fungicides so far in Pythium isolates at Holland Marsh. Overall summary, the initial studies are showing that low risk soils have some specific microorganism fungi and bacteria, no trends for Pythium. All orange carrot cultivars susceptible, although the NV is relatively more susceptible. Pythium sulcatum is the abundant species. All Pythium isolate tested so far are sensitive to fungicide, that's the Redomil. The research is ongoing. We are going to collect more field samples in 2023 to confirm the results of last two years. And based on these results from past three years, we will develop a pre-planned soil test, which will determine the risk of the disease cavity spot based on specific microorganism and some specific soil nutrients. After this, a method will be developed, which is again a soil test, which can quantify the amount of pathogen in the soil. So we can relate the severity of a disease with the pathogen in soil at seeding. Screening of more Pythium isolates will continue in 2023 to ensure that there is no resistance to fungicide Ritidomil at Holland Marsh. Thank you. Any questions in the room? Yeah, for right now, I think we had in this field trial, we look at 14 or 15 cultivars in total throughout three years. And we found that in all the orange carrot cultivar, the NV is the one which is most susceptible and susceptibility didn't vary that much among the other carrot cultivars. However, there is a detailed field trial every year at Macrop Research Station about the cultivar. It's, it's the carrot cultivar trial for cavity spot. And every year they tested a lot of cultivars and that's in Green Book Report. And they are also looking at some breeding of new cultivars to get some resistance to Pythium species. So far, all are susceptible. I have a question, Deborah, just so I understand correctly. 
when you took the soil samples, you're finding there's no difference in the actual level of lithium in the liquid. That's I have a lot of these versus less of these. It's all the other factors that are changing. Uh, for the lab, oh, okay, we didn't test the actual level yet. We will do it this year probably, but the kind of pitium species, we didn't find a trend that some specific species are more in low risk or some specific species are higher in high risk. But we find some trend for fungi and bacteria, but not pitium. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's just one that you're trying to develop here, that's going to measure uh, the severity or sort of a risk factor associated with lithium in those fields, right? Because currently the best you can do are basically a positive or negative, right? So if we can test all the fields in March, we're all positive, right? So it really doesn't help you. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's the positive, but we will basically developing to assess the risk. If the risk is high, so the field should be avoided. So it's based on severity, actually. Severe. Yes. Anyone else? Thank you, Oliver. Um, next up, our first industry presentation of the day is going to be uh, a bit of a switch. We're going to go with Bear, Marika. Welcome. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Marika. Yeah, on the agenda, you probably saw Anne McRae. So shout out to Anne. Thanks for switching uh, slots with me. I just had another commitment come up for this afternoon. Um, so yeah, Marika Patton with Bayer. I've been with Bayer for around 20 years. Um, you're probably also quite familiar with Laura Arts over the years. She still works with Bayer. She focuses on Hort in the South. Um, but we're excited to announce that we also have a new Hort specialist going to cover this area. So Margaret Alexu is here today. So make sure you uh, say hi to her when you see her. We are in the little trade show trade show room um, on the corner. But yeah, she graduated. I have my first typo on here. She graduated last year um, and based out of Beaton. So nice and local. So uh, she's looking forward to getting to, to know you guys. Um, so first up, I know it's carrot meeting, but I have a little bit of a full commercial. Is anybody in here grow any carrots and you care at all about any, or sorry, any potatoes? I got no hands. I'm going to skip a bunch. He's going to give me a bunch more time. No, <laughs> just, just enough in the backyard, right? Perfect. Okay. So I will start here with minuet. Um, what minuet is, it is a biological fungicide. Um, it can be used in organic production, but I would say most growers that are using it today are using it in conjunction with their conventional chemistries. And it is a replacement for serenade soil, if you've heard that name in the past. It is bacterium, so Bacillus subtilis, and it is registered on a number of crops. Obviously, there's a big list um, here. Up until this point, we've, we've done most of our field scale testing really on potatoes and tomatoes. Um, but we are looking, if anybody is interested in trying some uh, minuet in their crop this year, um, just, just talk to us and we'd love to do some trial work with you. Um, what it is again, Bacillus subtilis, so 379 mils per acre. Um, the big difference between minuet and serenade soil is its ease of use. So it is the same bacterial strain, um, but this is more concentrated. So a jug goes uh, further and also just the way that it works in your sprayer <laughs> uh, works a lot better. You can see that top picture, serenade, serenade soil, sometimes was really clunky. It would get stuck in your, in your filters, whereas the minuet comes out nice and clean. So ease of use um, is, is the big reason to be looking at minuet. But as a, oh, I even got a video, look at that. Pours just like chocolate milk. Don't drink it. Uh, so plant growth promoting activities is what we are seeing from uh, our biologicals like this. So the four main things that Minuet is doing is root colonization, uh, plant growth promoting compounds, induced systemic resistance, and nutrient solubilization. So what does that all mean? Well, probably not something you're going to see directly in the field, but what we're seeing is about a 5 to 6% yield uh, increase ver versus uh, untreated when you've got this in your program. So here's what it looks like under the microscope, um, how it's uh, colonizing the roots and just making them um, stronger to defend against disease. Next, I'll move just a couple uh, quick updates because everybody 
always ask is even though this is kind of the downer of the presentation, but what's going on with Admire? So obviously we've had some label changes with it. So as of May, 2023, so essentially for this season, we need to be using the newest label, uh, which means we have canceled uses for inferro applications for a number of crops. Um, foliar applications on a number of them have also been reduced just to one application and post bloom. There's more details on that, but just a reminder that those those changes have been made um, to the label. Uh, this is a minor use that just came through. So if you are doing green onions, just so you're aware, um, Oberon is available as a miticide. Uh, Vellum Prime, it also got some label expansions for minor use. So the, the main one here is garlic. Um, I know it's a carrot meeting and we've been wanting to see how it does on carrots. I think our biggest challenge with, with carrots is getting the product through the soil profile. So Vellum Prime, if you're not aware of the, of it, it's a fungicide that acts as a nematicide. Um, so it controls nematodes. Um, but I think with carrots in the profile, we're just not able to get it where it needs to be to give you that full protection. But on things like um, garlic, uh, we are seeing good activity there. So here's the list of minor use that are approved, but obviously um, carrots are missing there. Uh, so what else is new from Bayer Viego? It is our newest launch. It is an insecticide. It's also registered on a number of crops, uh, kind of for this room, probably the leafy vegetables um, and some of the other uh, head and stem vegetables. So the biggest one imported cabbage worm, diamondback moth and flea beetles, uh, very strong on those. Um, our potato friends love its control on Colorado potato, potato beetle. Uh, but what, what you'll like about it is fast knockdown, but the biggest thing is longer residual. Um, so here, diamondback moth on cabbage, we can see the Viago here. So five days after and 12 days after, still 100% control, where some of the other products, they start to taper off. So uh, really long residual um, with it. Uh, this is Colorado potato beetle, but still just shows you the, the length of control. Um, so Viago here, uh, even 21 days after, still giving over 75% control on Colorados, and that's all stages of them, which are, which are tough to control. This is a picture of uh, one, of the, one of the first places we tried it. Uh, these guys came munching in out of the volunteer corn or the corn field off of the volunteer potatoes beside. And again, just to show you how they can come in and clean up, uh, but 46, after, 46 hours after application, those, uh, those potato beetles were, were dead. So rain fast in one hour works well on a wide um, variety, wide range of temperatures, long lasting activity, 12 hour reentry, and a one day pre harvest interval um, for most vegetables. So that is also, uh, I think, key for a lot of people in the room. So second generation diamide, it is a group 28. So if you're looking for the group on on Viego, but again, that excellent residual performance. Um, and I just bolded the ones that were, were more key for people in the room. So that's kind of my quick little product update. Obviously, Bayer, we've got a number of, of products here um, that we stand behind. So uh, Margaret and I are happy to talk to you about any of these. Again, we're going to be in the room over lunch, too, uh, if you have any questions on, on any of them. Uh, my last little thing here just is on hot potatoes program. So all the products, um, they qualify for the hot potato rewards. Uh, but another thing new there is that climate field view is included, which is quick elevator pitch, but it's, it, uh, it's an app, but it's also a desktop where you can um, keep all your information in one place. And it also offers free satellite imagery. So it might be something you want to try on a farm or two or something like that. It's uh, totally complimentary. So talk to us if that's something that you are um, interested in getting started with. So with that, are there any questions? All right, I will um, pass it back to the team here and keep everybody on time. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll keep things moving. Next up on our agenda is uh, the Nematode Talk. So, um, I'm going to step in, you know, with the IPM program coordinator here at the MUC station, and we'll hand it over to him to talk about the Nematode work. Thanks, Dennis. 
Um, yeah, so today I want to talk about some of the main nematodes that we find in the hollow marsh, um, specifically in our carrot fields. Um, so these main three are the carrot cyst nematode, the root knot nematode, and the root lesion nematode. So just a little bit of background on plant parasitic nematodes um, in general. Um, most of them are soil-borne pathogens, um, so most of them reside in the soil. Um, again, these are the three that we're most concerned with. Um, and most plant parasitic nematodes feed on the roots of plants. And when they do this, they impede water and nutri nutrient uptake. Um, they can distort root, root crops, um, making them unmarketable. And they can also create uh, secondary feeding points. Um, well, create entry points, sorry, for secondary pathogens to enter the plant, um, such as fungi or bacteria. Um, and there's uh, their, their populations in field kind of aren't uniform throughout. They tend to be patchy, um, and you tend to have higher um, higher populations at certain locations in your field. All right, so starting with the carrot cyst nematode. So sometimes we just refer to this as CCN. Um, its only known hosts are cultivated and wild carrots, so a pretty narrow uh, host range there. And they can affect when uh, temperatures, soil temperatures range from five to 30 degrees Celsius. So quite a wide range there. And from what we know, we expect there to be at least two generations of the carrot cyst nematode uh, per growing season. And this nematode is interesting because at the beginning of the season, it starts off as a little egg. Um, it hatches into a juvenile. And then most of these juveniles develop into females this large darker uh, cyst here. And this female produces eggs both outside of her body in, uh, in an egg mass, and then also inside her body as well. Um, and these eggs that reside inside of the cyst are actually able to overwinter and then uh, basically wait and infect when there's another host present. Um, and these eggs can remind, remain viable inside the cyst for many years. Um, though from year to year, they do say that there's generally a 30 to 50% uh, die off. So when carrot cyst nematodes uh, uh, parasitize, uh, they generally cause these stunted or forked carrots. Um, and then obviously these carrots are unmarketable. Um, sometimes when you do pull up uh, some carrots from your field, you might notice some of these small white cysts on some of the fine root hairs. And these are the female. Um, carrot cyst nematodes feeding. So that's an indication that uh, you possibly do have this nematode in your field. And when populations are very high, we can uh, see yield losses exceeding 35%. So in terms of its distribution, um, the nematode is found throughout the world um, in carrot producing areas. And we first reported it here in the Hall Marsh um, in Ontario in 2017. And since that time, we've been conducting uh, a number of uh, soil tests and monitoring a number of soils uh, throughout uh, the province. And so far, we've found that the carrot cyst nematode is only present in the Holland and Keswick Marsh. We've also tested some other muck soils uh, throughout the province, and we haven't found any. And also in mineral soils, we haven't found any carrot cyst nematodes as well. And of all of these, um, fields in the Holland and Keswick Marsh, we found that the nematode is present in about 87% of fields. So, so it's quite widespread in the marsh here. So since we have uh, a tight rotation here in the marsh, carrots and onions um, most commonly, and this nematode does have a bit of a unique biology, we want to test how the population changes from year to year um, through specifically a carrot and onion rotation. So from 2016, most years we conducted monitoring and soil sampling where in 20, in one year, I should say, uh, which was a carrot crop, we would sample the soil and um, extract the nematodes and count the nematodes and, and see what we have. And then the next year, we would come back to the exact same fields that were now in on onion production and then also extract the nematodes and count them. And what we generally found was this increase in most of the years um, from year to year. The juveniles are only present, obviously, 
in the carrot uh, production years, they don't hatch and um, they aren't active during the onion years. There, uh, there was a little bit of a decrease here between 2019 and 2020. Uh, we're not really sure why that is, but for the most part, the, um, the levels of cyst nematodes in the fields increased from year to year. And just to kind of show this a little bit more, um, we've been sampling two fields um, continuously from 2016 that were on a carrot and onion rotation. Um, and here we have both cysts and juveniles. Um, but if we just kind of focus and highlight on the cysts, we can see this general incline in the number of cysts that are developing in the field. Um, so definitely something to think about and something that's really important to monitor. So since these nematodes are present in our fields here, we've conducted a number of uh, fumigant and nematicide trials to try to determine if there are any that uh, help control this nematode. So in 2019, um, I'll just show a couple of our trials here. These aren't all of them, but um, in 2019, we did conduct a trial where we looked at products like Movento and Vidate that have nematicidal activities. Uh, we looked at a new nematicide called Celebro, um, our fumigants, PIC plus and Busan, and there was a couple of bio biologicals there as well. Um, numerically, we did see a little bit lower um, percent nematode damage in these Movento and Celebro treatments. However, statistically, they weren't different from the untreated check. Um, and one thing important to, to notice here is that any treatment or product with a star beside it is not registered uh, for controlling keratosis nematode in carrots. So in our 2020 trial, we can see that there was quite a bit of variation in the amount of nematode damage among all of the treatments. Um, no treatment stood out here. Um, and again, um, all of these products, uh, there's a couple combinations here, um, were not statistically different uh, from the untreated check. And um, they, are, they also aren't registered for, uh, for controlling this nematode, unfortunately. So in summary on keratosis nematodes, um, what do we know so far? Uh, generally, fumigants are probably the best way to manage this nematode right now. Um, there are no real effective nematicides. Um, the newer product, uh, Slebro or Reclamel, uh, you may have also heard it, heard it called this name. Um, it is not registered for keratosis nematode use, and it really doesn't have consistent efficacy on this nematode either. One of the common um, practices a lot of people try to use uh, to manage nematodes in your fields is crop rotation. Um, however, this kind of really isn't a suitable option uh, for us here in the marsh due to our tight rotations, um, carrots, onions, even if you have a celery in there, um, it really is a fairly tight rotation. And again, these nematodes can remain viable inside of these cysts for many years, although the, their, their numbers do decline inside of the, the eggs, um, but one cyst, say over three years, can possibly equal 20 cysts um, in, uh, in, th in three years or so. That, that could be viable and continue to infect um, and turn into females and continue the process all over again. I should also note too that uh, just for interest sake, some of these cysts, um, they contain anywhere from 30 to 130 eggs. So it's not like um, one to 20 or anything like that it can get up into the hundreds. All right, so moving on now to the root knot nematode. Um, so generally we try to, we generally refer to this nematode as RKN, um, but this nematode really has a, a really wide host range, over 550 crops and weed hosts. Um, and in carrots, it has a really low threshold as well, which is zero. So if you have one root knot nematode per kilogram of soil, you are considered over threshold. And that's because this nematode can cause quite a bit of damage. Um, this nematode isn't as common as keratosis nematode in the hollow marsh. Um, from year to year, we generally find that uh, we see this kind of damage in one or two fields. Um, so it really isn't as widespread as the keratosis nematode. Um, but again, when it is present, it can cause a lot of damage. And this is a developing female right here. So this nematode has multiple generations per season. Um, this female 
um, or this process is kind of similar to the um, to the carrot cyst nematode. Uh, the nematode starts out as an egg in the beginning of the season. Um, for the most part, sometimes there's juveniles, but those eggs hatch into juveniles. Um, most of them develop into females, and this is a female here, um, and this female enlarges basically as they as it as she feeds, um, and she basically lays a number of eggs. Um, on average, they say around 500 eggs um, outside of her body into this uh, what's called a gelatinous matrix matrix here, um, and these eggs are, are generally the ones that overwinter and sometimes the, they overwinter as these egg masses as well. So when this nematode feeds, it creates these, um, these knots or gulls that you may see on some of the, the, the finer roots. Um, these are, are what are called giant cells that the, the nematode uh, feeds off of and the plant's response is basically to create these knots or gulls. Um, when this nematode does parasitize, you can get a lot of this bumpy surface of the carrot. Um, and a lot of these carrots can also be forked and stunted as well. Um, most often this nematode uh, throughout the field, their populations are patchy um, and it's, it's not kind of uniform or, or widespread throughout the field. For the most part, uh, we have seen a couple um, that are widespread, um, but for the most part, they are usually these, these patchy locations in a field. And just an example of this. Um, so when you look at this field here, you can kind of see um, a general area where you're getting lower stand. Uh, the foliage is uh, it has declined a little bit and is a little bit stunted. Um, so you can kind of assume that uh, an area like this, there's obviously a problem, and it might be uh, a root knot nematode or some kind of nematode. And in this case, it is root knot nematode. And when we pulled out carrots from that area. Um, you get these really hairy, full of these little galls um, and stunted and forked carrots here. So that's kind of an obvious patchy kind of area um, that could you could potentially see. However, um, when you do kind of, we, we, we didn't want to just check this, uh, this small patch right here. We wanted to kind of look around um, and see how some of these other carrots might be affected. So we grabbed some carrot samples from uh, in, in some better looking areas. This foliage looks all good, doesn't really look that stunted or anything. However, when we did pull these carrots out uh, from these nicer looking areas, we did still see quite a bit of galling, uh, not as hairy, obviously, but uh, a little bit of stunting and some forking as well. Um, so this is just, uh, I just wanted to show this to kind of emphasize that sometimes we can't always see where our nematode damage is in our field. Uh, sometimes it really goes unnoticed until you start pulling the carrots out of the ground. So again, we've uh, we've conducted a number of nematicide trials to look at which nematicides control root knot nematode in carrots. So I'll just show two from 2019 and 2021 here. So in 2021, um, we had some really good results. The product Celebro at uh, a number of different rates uh, was statistically uh, significant and statistically better than the untreated check in terms of percent nematode damage. So that was great to see. Uh, we also had Nimitz in here, um, but it was it was similar to the untreated check. Um, but really good to see that this uh, nematicide uh, does have a, have a positive effect and can control uh, root knot nematode. Um, and you'll notice here there's no more stars or asterisks uh, beside the treatments, and that's because this nematicide is now registered for root knot nematode control in carrots. <laughs> However, we don't always get these nice trials. Um, in 2021, um, we had Celebro, uh, we had Vidate. Again, Vidate has some nematicidal activities, uh, combinations of, of uh, the two, um, Nimitz as well. Um, but in this trial, we didn't see any statistically significant differences among the treatments. Um, this could be due to a number of factors. Um, one of them being the nematode population in this field and this trial. Uh, was very sporadic, very patchy. Um, so that really had an influence on the results. Um, and also in 2021 too, after seeding, um, it was a bit of a drier year. Uh, we did have a little bit of stand loss um, and with the drier environments, the soil was drier um, and uh, the product possibly wasn't able to activate and, and uh, 
uh, the nematodes likely weren't able to intercept um, the nematocyte. So a little bit of a summary on root knot nematode. So the good thing is the, the new nematocyte reclamel um, is now registered and it can provide good control. Um, this nematode overwinters as eggs, sometimes juveniles, um, but it is important to know too, this nematode can't last as long without a host as the carrot cyst nematode. And again, it, it isn't as common or widespread as the carrot cyst nematode here in the hollow marsh. Um, and uh, I also wanted to note as well, onions are a host. Um, they're not really a primary host. Um, so there could be a potential if you do have high root knot nematode in your field or patches, um, if you're kind of on a carrot onion rotation, um, the populations of root knot nematodes might be able to be maintained or build up from year to year. All right, so one of the last nematodes I just kind of wanted to touch on was the root lesion nematode. Um, we often refer to this nematode as RLN, um, and it has quite a wide host range as well, over 350 crop and weed hosts. Um, however, it does have a little bit of a higher threshold, 1,000 root, root lesion nematodes per kilogram of soil. So carrots are, are often able to kind of withstand this kind of parasitism a little bit more than root knot nematode. This nematode also can have multiple generations uh, in one season. This nematode feeds within the root hairs of carrots. Um, and as you can see here, its parasitism can cause really hairy um, forking and stunted uh, carrots. Um, this nematode, though, it doesn't create any of those cysts or knots or gulls um, that root knot ne nematode and the carrot cyst nematode do. So um, you're not going to be seeing any of those, uh, those knots or gulls here. It'll just kind of be very hairy. Um, and often, uh, and obviously, these carrots are rendered unmarketable. Um, but really, the, this kind of damage is quite patchy uh, when populations are very high. We really don't see kind of widespread high populations here in the marsh. I would say that um, probably 15 to 20% of our fields have root lesion nematode. Uh, we haven't uh, monitored uh, for root lesion nem nematode exclusively, um, but of the fields that we have kind of looked at, and we looked at all nematodes, um, I would say kind of around 15 to 20% of our fields have root, root lesion nematodes in them. So we did conduct a nematicide trial for root lesion nematode in 2020. And um, this trial actually had some pretty interesting results. We did see that Celebro, Vidate, and a combination of the two were statistically uh, better than the untreated check and had lower percent nematode damage um, than the untreated check. However, you will see too that um, there is a star beside each of these uh, treatments, and that's because the product uh, is not registered for root lesion control on carrots. Um, there's actually supposed to be a little bit less efficacy uh, for that nematicide on root lesion nematodes. Um, but there's supposed to be really good efficacy on uh, root knot nematodes, as we saw. So one of the last nematodes I kind of wanted to touch on a little bit um, was the pin nematode. So we find this nematode throughout the marsh. Um, often their populations are quite low. They do have a carrot threshold of 5,000 uh, pin nematodes per kilogram of soil. We're really a little bit unsure of how um, the symptoms uh, of their feeding on uh, carrots. Uh, it could be some of the stunting, hairiness. Uh, again, these nematodes don't cause any galls or, or cysts or anything like that. Um, possibly some forking. Um, so we continue to kind of monitor this, but uh, there, there is always the, po the possibility that uh, feeding by this nematode can create entry points for other secondary pathogens um, to enter the soil. And again, this nematode is, is quite widespread throughout the marsh. So what kind of have we learned in general um, throughout all of our trials and, and monitoring for all these types of nematodes? Um, well, we found that the new nematicide Celebro, uh, which is registered for root knot nematode control um, and likely fumigants um, for all plant parasitic nematodes are really our best options to control nematodes at the moment. 
Um, it would be it would be great if we had other options, but but really this is this is what we have right now: Slebro for root, not nematode control, and fume against for the others. Um, we 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 kind of believe too that most of the effective products might be ones that have a little bit longer um, lasting activity, and um, that might go with the, without even being said. Um, but this kind of just allows time for the nematodes if they're not um, directly where that nematocyte is placed. Um, it allows time for the nematodes to um, basically swim through to the carrot um, and intercept the, nem the nematocyte and, uh, and hopefully be killed off. And we're also thinking that uh, nematocytes might be a little bit more effective when we work them into our carrot hills or we apply them in furrow. Um, basically, we want to get that product to where it needs to be and where the nematodes are and where the carrot's going to grow. Um, so applying these nematicides on the surface uh, really isn't going to do a whole lot for you. And another uh, really important thing is just to continue monitoring um, these nematodes. So soil sampling your fields, testing your fields for these nematodes is very important to track um, this potential population growth for carrot cyst nematodes and also look at any possible other nematodes you might have in your soils as well. So I just wanted to state that um, I'm sure everybody saw, but we have our 2022 green book available for, uh, for everyone. Uh, feel free to grab a copy. Um, all of our research and cultivar trials are, um, are printed in there. If you are looking for any past reports uh, as well, they are all available on our website. So feel free to visit our website and check all those out. And with that, I'd just like to thank all the participating growers, um, the Ontario Agri-Food Innovation Alliance, the Fresh Veg Growers of Ontario, the Bradford Co-op, uh, all of our industry partners and uh, all the staff and students here at the uh, the Muck Station. So thank you, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. No questions online, any in the room? Yeah. Uh, when you're scouting for the nematodes, is there like areas where they're going to be higher and lower? Like get a dry hole and there's going to be more there or just leave a more wet holes through a higher level than certain areas that you do? Yeah, they say sometimes um, it, can, it can vary a little bit, but sometimes those knolls, um, it, it, the, the nematode is, it is a, it is an aquatic organism. So it can survive in soil, uh, sorry, in, in water and in pretty saturated areas. But if something's saturated for too long um, or flooded a little bit, um, they can't survive for too long in those types of conditions. Um, but yeah, their, their populations just can just be really sporadic uh, throughout the field for sure. Yeah. Any other questions? We'll get in from online. Any differences in the activity of fumigants between the different nematode species? Um, <laughs> I really can't say because really we looked at the fumigants for uh, carrot cyst nematode. We didn't look at fumigants for root knot nematode or uh, root lesion nematode. Um, so just for carrot cyst nematode, we can only, um, what, what I've kind of showed here is, is kind of the trend we've been seeing. Um, it seems like they do have some efficacy um, and can control nematodes a little bit, but it, we've also seen it to be a little bit variable um, in their ability to control as well. In the idea with the population they're doing over time, do you track anything through for for scarcity, for example? Care, uh, it, uh, like in terms of their populations after fume again? Yeah, or after fume again, and then from the same field. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we've done, you know, um, sampling before application, two weeks after, eight weeks after, and, um, and uh, at harvest as well. Um, uh, we have seen, I guess you could say, some trends. Nematode populations are are really hard to um, to 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 get results from. They're they're so variable sometimes, um, but sometimes we do see see a dieback, especially after a product is applied. Sometimes later in the season, you can maybe see a few more of the nematodes um, within those plots uh, that you treated. Um, that could just also be a result of those nematodes, say, coming up and uh, then making themselves present um, in those soils after those nematicides or fumigants um, really aren't that active anymore. Last case. If 
Done. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. Appreciate it. We're your tickets in for the door prizes. This is the last talk before lunch. So if you haven't yet, grab one. Go grab one now. And I'll uh, turn over to Kevin to do that care research update for this year. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to give a quick update on some of our research trials that we conducted uh, in 2022 at the research station. So the uh, projects I'm going to look at are screening carrots for resistance to cavity spots. This is an ongoing project that we've been working on for probably the last 15 years or more. And then uh, also going to go through our pythium fungicide trial that we looked at um, as well. So I know Ember talked about uh, this a little bit. So what conditions promote cavity spot? Um, we have susceptible cultivars, uh, the red carrots, we know are very susceptible, purple are very resistant, and there's a huge um, variation among, uh, among orange carrots. Um, soil moisture is very important. It is a water mold. Um, so when soil is wet, that increases uh, the risk of disease. Poor drainage in your fields, heavy rains, um, especially high soil moisture um, in August, September. So it's two to three months after seeding and sort of a month and a half before harvest. And then cooler temperatures in the fall. Um, that doesn't seem to happen as much uh, anymore, um, but the, the warmer the soil and the warmer the air, um, we usually have uh, a reduced cavity spot incidence in those years. So our cavity spot objectives, um, we're working with Phil Simon at uh, the University of Wisconsin and the, the uh, the USDA uh, carrot breeding program from Wisconsin to look at resistance to cavity spot. These trials are, are funded by the California California carrot growers. Um, they're the ones that are putting the money in to, uh, to help screen this project uh, as, well, as well. So we looked at um, some varieties. Atomic red has been a susceptible uh, carrot that we've looked at. And then we've looked at a various um, cello carrots, including cello bunch, maverick, envy, Nairobi, and since it is uh, funded by the California growers, we are looking at some cut and peel varieties, Triton, Propeel, um, Imperial Cuts and things like that. The goals of our project um, long-term are to contribute to the USDA breeding program to help improve the genetic stock and to look at carrots that will be resistant um, to cavity spot that can be then um, put into commercial uh, seed programs. As a, an as, as aside, we're also looking at leaf blight, forking, and bolting as, uh, as other factors that uh, we're trying to look at improving as well. Umbrin went through this. So there's several different species that cause cavity spot. These are the ones that cause cavity spot in California. If you look at sulcatum, we have that. We have viola in common. So it's good that someone else is helping funding this because we have the same problem. Um, and we have a problem in our fields. In California, they have it's a lot more spotty, so we have a consistent um, a consistent source here on the research station. I was looking back, we were doing cavity spot trials in 2000, and, um, the year 2000, so some people in the room probably weren't even born then, but uh, we've been doing it for a while, so we've got a good pressure uh, most years. And some of the work Umbrin's been doing, so these have been confirmed. It's not old data, it's new data that we, you know, it's still a problem, and these are still the the species of pythium that we uh, that we that we run into. Our methods, so we're basically seeding carrots on hills. Um, we're looking at 65 lines, um, which include the cultivars. We put them on in early June. Um, we basically do a 20 foot row, and then we don't apply any fungicides, and then we grow them normally. Um, we don't put any herbicides. We use herbicides and insecticides, but we're not putting any fungicides, so we can assess for leaf blight uh, in the fall. So like I said, we're looking at uh, both Cercospora and Alternaria, and then we're also assessing for carrot forking, um, which can also be caused by Pythium. So we're trying to see if um, these cultivars are the, are the, the lines, breeding lines also are, uh, have differences in, in carrot forking. So we're looking at um, a 50 carrot sample if possible at harvest. Um, we put them in the storage and then uh, usually in early December, late uh, October, we're assessing for cavity spots. So we're basically washing them in our in our drum washer and then looking at um, the incidence and severity. And severity is based on, on how big the lesion is. So um, sort of one to two millimeter, um, you'd still consider markable when they get to three, four, five, you have these bigger spots that uh, 
are, are more noticeable and, and probably unmarketable at that point. And then we do the carrot leaf blight and bolting in the field. And our bolting, our leaf blight assessment, um, no disease is zero and five, the, the foliage is mostly dead. So from 2022, um, overall, we've, uh, we've had improved stands. So we have good seed germination and our we're relatively low cavity spot, 53% was our highest and our highest severity was 23. So you still might think that's high, but in other years we've had 90, 100% um, of some carrots. We did irrigate the trial in August um, to try and improve the soil moisture, but September and October had very low rainfall. So it did end up um, having a drier fall than, uh, than normal, which probably led to our, our lower cavity spot. And then we, we, we had low incidence of, uh, of leaf blight in lots of the varieties. Um, our highest was 3.9 on our, on our five scale. So we did have some bad ones, but for the most part, they were relatively low. And then we had up to 15% forking in some, of our, in some of our varieties. This was from 2020. Um, carrot bolting is, is usually contributed factors are the weather, um, but these are also not commercial lines. So we can run into lines that aren't sort of suited for this climate. Um, but in the last few years, we've had much better success than we've had. This is from 2020, um, where we get some lines you can have almost 100% that uh, that go to seed. So looking at our uh, incidence of cavity spot in, in sort of some of our representative lines, if you look here, any of the lines that have uh, 77338B or uh, 85B also has, um, I think, uh, 77337. These lines are, are what we found um, consistently the last few years have, have relatively low cavity spot. So these are anywhere from um, sort of four to 5%. And then if you look, uh, yeah, so these are the two lines that we're most interested in that have, so these are combinations. You have a whole bunch of different parents and crosses and, and things like that. But the consistent one is that they contain either one of these parents. And then if you look, brilliance was our lowest, uh, orange carrot, and then imperial cuts was our, uh, our highest uh, orange carrot. We, we had envy in this trial, but um, turns out, I guess the seed wasn't that good and we had very poor germination. So um, we weren't able to test that in, in this one. And then atomic red um, over 53% uh, was our highest. So here you can see atomic red, these are the clean carrots. And then we have sort of low, medium, high, um, and very high. So you see these spots here where you have giant, uh, giant uh, cankers on the, on the carrots. And then here's the average from the, the ones that include uh, sort of 38B, sort of 4.5 in the severity. Here, this is a, a picture that didn't have any. So on the average was 4.5, this carrot. And if you look at these carrots, they don't look half bad for an orange carrot. Um, which is a good, which is a good thing going forward. And then this is the three seven B, so average six percent and severity. So these are very small spots. So we could find a spot. I found out I'm getting old. Every other year, I looked at carrots. I didn't need glasses. When I started looking at carrots this year, I couldn't see the small spots anymore. So I had to find a pair of old glasses and wear glasses to do um, the assessment for the first time. So. I was a little bit disappointed about that, but I could see the spots much better after I put glasses on. So um, when you look at thousands of carrots, you, people say, can you still see it? Well, yeah, you can see it, but uh, with glasses, it made it much easier this year. Not bad for 26 years, I guess. So, so in summary, um, we had lower pressure uh, than in previous years. The resistance at the cavity spot, um, it doesn't relate very well to the overall forking. So even though we had low cavity spots, some of those lines still maybe have more fork carrots, but fork carrots could also be caused from a number of other factors, not just the pythium. Um, but some lines did have low levels of both. As I mentioned, the lines with parents um, of these two, 37 and 38B, had lower disease. And this is not the first year, this is probably the fifth year. Um, and talking with Phil Simon, these, these lines are now, um, he feels confident to release these to the seed companies. So, um, so that's a good, a good uh, outcome after all our years of, of testing. We have made some progress um, looking at these lines. So just because they've been released to the seed companies, it still could be um, a few more years down the line before those get, uh, those get put in. 
companies are also doing their own. Um, we've had other trials from other seed companies and they're doing their own breeding um, for resistance. So hopefully these can be combined with those um, and, and in the future have some level of cavity spot resistance uh, that, that's available um, for us here. Looking at our, our Pythium drench trial. So again, not so much cavity spot, maybe cavity spot, but also then forking. So we wanna look at, uh, at varieties that uh, are at products that uh, are registered for Pythium control um, and, and how they how they perform uh, in our trial here. So we looked at uh, high cal limestone. So we put five tons a hectare on prior to seeding. And then we looked at inferro applications um, of uh, picobutrinox and Ritamil gold liquid. And then we assessed stand forking um, and mid season and, and a hot, at harvest cavity spot uh, assessments. So here you can see the lime um, sort of spread out. So we basically just, uh, yeah, poured it on there. And then just as we made the hills, we worked it in. So we didn't pre-spread it as we came with the cedar and the better, we uh, we incorporated into the soil. And then the in furrow, so we've got tanks and we've got a, a triple irrigation um, nozzle that'll apply product uh, directly over the three carat, the carat rows as we seed. So those are the, how the in furrow treatments uh, were applied. So looking at our, uh, this is the percent cavity spot disease, a little bit all over the place. So Ritamil, we had about 25%, but when we add calcium, we, it actually went up and made it worse, um, which isn't what you would expect. You think the calcium should um, improve control. The carbutrinox sort of in the middle did a little bit. Um, calcium really didn't help, but compared to the untreated check, everything was a little bit better, but uh, it was still a little bit all over, um, all over the place. And you think Ritamil with calcium would, would actually improve it, but it didn't in 2022. So, so we did have some significant differences, um, but applying the granular calcium didn't seem to help um, as much as we would have hoped. So we're gonna continue some of this work um, in the future, um, look at more granular. There's also a, a couple foliar calcium products. So we're gonna try um, um, spray some of those on to see if we can translocate, translocate those down into the roots as well as do some soil and tissue testing um, in the season to see what our calcium levels are um, in the carrots and in the soil um, to help understand if calcium is, is helping to improve uh, the overall pythium control for us. As Tyler mentioned, everything's in our green book and on our website. And I'd like to thank the California Fresh Carrot Advisory Board as well as the uh, Ontario Agri-Food Innovation Alliance for the, the Pythium funding um, and the technical assistance from Jeff and uh, all our summer students for this summer. I think that is it for me. Yeah, well, your lime work there, why so preceding like limestone's calcium carbonate or even like, I wouldn't expect that calcium to be, be available. So I'm not sure why why calcium carbonate there and not something like calcium sulfate, like gypsum, which would get much more availability in calcium if that's what you were after. Yeah, I don't know why we chose that. I can't remember can't remember either, but so that might, yeah. So we 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 might switch some of that stuff up. Right. Okay. Yep. Have you tried uh, difference in cavity spot if you're seeding the fall carrots in let's say early May as compared to like waiting to June? Have you found a difference in the end? There's a difference between waiting longer or seeding the fall carrots? No, I think the 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 pythium starts to infect sort of in August, September. So I don't think the size of your carrots at that time um it's the the soil moisture at that time i don't think the size of the carrots because they grow the you know you grow cut and peel carrots they don't get very big there but it still happens that you know the carrot doesn't have to be a certain age it's a timing of the of the season that the pythian is most active waiting works for carrot weevil not maybe so much for cavity spots so Yeah. Uh, you said on the slide, did you guys water in August the carrots? We did just because it hadn't rained. Yeah. So we did put a little bit of water and we wanted to 
encouraged to have enough cavity spot, but it didn't really, we didn't keep watering because we eventually took the pipes out, but yeah. Is there anywhere where you didn't have any water uh, applied in August? Like Not to these trials, so we watered them all, so. I was just curious if it was in drier areas, you see more cavity spots. So I think in drier areas, you see less cavity spots. So when we have a wet fall, then we have more cavity spot show up. So that soil moisture in September and October is directly related to, to higher cavity spot. Where it sort of starts in August and then goes into the fall. So since the fall was dry, I think that's one of the reasons we, we didn't see as much cavity spot as we did say in 2020 or 20, 2021 was really wet, right? So we had, yeah. you know, these same cultivars, we had 90% in, in some of our high ones, so. All right, so. Dennis will be back in a minute. So uh, hope everyone enjoyed lunch. Thank you to the Rusty Q for uh, delicious pizza this uh, today. Fresh coffee if you warm up. I don't know who said it was going to be 15 today, but that is not happening. So, all right. So we have Dennis here today. He's going to give us an update on Astra Yellows and uh, a little bit of storage uh, issues, sclerotinia as well. So take it away, Dennis. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, I'll cover some topics that historically may have not been um, heavily covered, but have kind of reared up the last couple of years. So Aster Yellows and Sclerotinia both have kind of, I guess, become more prevalent for whatever reason in the last couple of years. So I'll cover some of what to look for and what to do about it. First off, I'd like to talk about Aster Yellows um, and Aster Leaf Auburn, some of the things to look for in the field. You're looking for your leaves turning yellow. And then eventually res, so you see the yellow on the edge might look a bit like uh, nitrogen deficiency or something like that. But uh, from this, you get this. So, right, it's starting to turn yellow, then it turns red. That's could be potassium deficiency as well. But a lot of times this red leaf is generally aster yellows. And how you tell is you go down to the base of the plant after you see these red leaves and you'll see all these sprouts coming up. So a whole bunch of new sprouts coming from the crown of the carrot, a whole bunch of new sprouts. If you pull this, right, lots of new sprouts. So red leaves, sprouts, and you pull it up and it has a whole bunch of roots. So basically a bunch of, of crazy roots coming out of the aster. Yellow's infected carrot. All of the root hairs get all gnarly and they get raised and um, the main issue is it looks ugly and it becomes really bitter to eat as well. And it's uh, general hard to hard to grade out a lot of times. What causes it? It's um, basically, uh, it's, a, it's a phytoplasm, but it's basically a bacteria. So what happens is uh, the aster leaf hopper or leaf hoppers will spread it around. You'll get bacteria basically in the carrot, which then plugs up the phloem. So it's, it's plugging up what's moving the sugars around the plant plant can't move sugars around anymore it starts to get all crazy that's why it's sprouting a whole bunch of new sprouts and and leaves and that's why the leaves start to turn yellow and then red is because it, they're not like able to move the resources around the plant like they used to so it's plugging all this up and it can be spread from plant to plant what spreads it usually the aster leaf hopper there are a couple of leaf hoppers that can spread it but we're mostly worried about this aster leaf hopper kind of a bluey green thing this is on a sticky trap here it's got a couple dots on its head right? Really distinct set of dots on its head. You can even tell it uh, um, without a microscope a lot of times. When you get your orange sticky traps out, this is what it's going to look like. Bluey green, you can see it's got those spots in this head. This is what's spreading around all the aster yellows in the field. So it's eating ones from infected ones, it's making new ones infected, and then it's spreading from there. So when this aster yellows or uh, leafhopper is feeding on the plants, it actually takes a while in order for those symptoms to show up in the field. So I stole this from the Canola Council. Um, basically, this is your aster leaf hopper. It's feeding on a already inflected one. Now it's got the bacteria all in its gut, and it's going to feed on your new carrots, spitting out all this new bacteria in the carrots. It's going to pick it up and continue to spread. And then a couple weeks later, it's going to start to show the symptoms. So the issue is when the leaf hoppers show up and they start feeding, that's when the initial bacteria gets infected and you're not seeing anything in the field until a couple weeks later. And by then it's too late. 
by then you've also had a bunch of other plants in the area that are also affected and are going to start showing symptoms in the next couple of weeks. Where are they coming from? We, there's two main places we get them from. One's a local population, so they can overwinter, mostly on winter grains, winter wheat, that kind of thing. But our main issue is the stuff that comes up from the south. So this is a shot from uh, middle of June. Um, the prevailing winds, the middle of June. You can see all the agriculture in Texas and the Gulf states. It's picking up all the acid leaf fossils in there that are infected with that bacteria. They're coming in and it's depositing it nicely right here in southwestern Ontario. So this is our main issue is that in the middle of June, we get deposits on storms coming up from the south that all of a sudden there's a flush of infected acid leaf hoppers that show up in the field. What makes it a bad year? What uh, sort of when do I spray? How do I know it's going to be a bad year? We've, we went through, I don't know, a half a dozen years where it was not a huge issue. You hardly saw any showing up in the last number of years. Um, you know, this is, you see all this red leaves over here. Like that's, that's, you know, five, five to 10% incidents in, in those carrots that are going to need to be graded out on the line by hand. Um, what causes that? And how it's uh, related to infectivity. So not all of these ash leaf hoppers have the bacteria, they're not all going to spread it. Um, how much of that population that has it changes from year to year. This is a graph from a low Astro Yellows year in 2020 and a high Astro Yellows year in 2021. The low year is in blue, the high year is in red. Um, any major difference between the two? I don't know, not really. Like the high year we had sort of the second week of June, high numbers, they stay elevated to the second week of July. Similar in the non high year you know we have spikes all the way from the middle second week of june all the way to sort of the end of july there's spikes and pretty high pressure later in the year it sort of levels off not as big of an issue but this is when we start to see it in the field right this is when the symptoms start to show up but the issue is right here so we're not seeing much differences in the numbers from a high year and a low year but it's going to relate to the infectivity how many of those coming up from the south have it which i'll get into the next slide um one other thing I want to touch on is, is when, when do we normally spray for leaf hoppers, I think? When the trap counts are high, when the IPM program says high, like I guess um, it, it depends on the grower, but really our spray window is really early. Like the second week of June to the middle of July, this is when we need to put insecticides on for acid leaf hoppers, not in July into August and September when we're starting to see symptoms. That's way too late. It's really this early section where we need to be worrying about their numbers and applying insecticides at that time. So no difference in really the trap counts from a bad year and a high year. Well, if I go back to these prevailing winds, right? It's picking it all up from the South. It's dropping it down in Southwestern Ontario. It's also dropping it down here in Michigan. Um, so Michigan, what they do is they sweep net in all their fields. So they collect all the astral leaf hoppers, they send it to the lab and they, they um, run it through a test to see if they have it or not. So they've been doing this the last number of years. So this is their, their data. So two years of low numbers, you can see they're catching lots of them, but they only have 0.4% that actually have the bacteria that's going to cause problems in them. Very low, 1.4% in the carrot field, 0.2%. This is the issue here. This is why we see so much the last two years is because we're at 9.4% infectivity in the leaf hoppers that are coming up from the South in 2021 and you know 4% in salary fields. So this is um, directly related, not necessarily in the numbers, but the infectivity. So a lot of times we'll, um, um, we'll use the Michigan data to sort of uh, predict whether or not it's going to be a big Astro Yellows year or not. We went through a whole stretch where that wasn't as big of an issue. Now we're keeping track uh, more often of what it's looking like coming up from the south. So a bunch of things you can do. There is tolerant varieties. I'm not aware of a lot of work that's being done on the tolerance anyways, but they will list them. Uh, the seed companies will list that as an attribute on them. We can scout for them, right? Talk to, talk to Tyler, the IPM program. They're going to have traps in your field. You're going to know exactly when you're going to need to spray, and it's probably going to be earlier than you might think. Um, read the updates. The updates are going to give you a whole picture of the area of when you need to spray. 
not necessarily just your fields and and spray and what to spray so uh, i'm going to pull this up quickly this is our um sort of our new publications for crop protection it's on an online database format um so i'll kind of run you through what if you have if you're not aware of this and you i'll sort of run through what you're looking for so this is our crop protection hub if you want weed control stuff it's here if you're growing fruit which you're not click on the vegetable one it's going to ask you for your crop so you just put in carrots boom you can select by seed treatment or whatever you're going to apply it by i don't really care so i'm just going to do my scrolling is backwards which is messing me up skip and it's going to list everything registered for carrots what we're going to do is going to go to view filters i'm going to say i only care about leaf hoppers please clicks leaf hoppers everything registered for leaf hoppers shows up so you got seven right everybody knows seven it's been around forever contact um a little bit uh admire which as we learned this morning right no more inferro applications if you're using inferro which is the problem now you're going to apply it foliar you got closer you got savanto and if you're an organic grower you got surround so let's say i'm going to use i like savanto details pulls up you can click on the label so it'll lead you straight to the label it has the pcp number there some information i click on the leaf operate information 200 to 300 mils an acre um, and any relevant comments rei phi that kind of thing so that's how you use this tool so there are uh, products that are available seven is going to be a knockdown if you have lots of numbers what you really want to do is apply systemic so admire closer and savanto are all systemics which means you need to get them on early. They need to get in the plant so that when the leaf hoppers come and feed, they're going to ingest the insecticide and then die. So it, it's the, something that you need to get on before they show up in high numbers because you need that time to get it in the plant in the high numbers. So keep that in mind when you're using the different products. This is going to be your knockdown. The rest of them are going to be your earlier to get them inside the plant and systemic options. Any questions on that? Short and sweet and master yellows and master leaf hopper. Um, next, I'll go into sclerotinia white mold. And I have storage rots here too, because there are a number of rots that we deal with. Sclerotinia is probably the biggest one, the most common one, but I'll also show you um, some of the other ones. So I'm sure most of you are aware of this in boxes coming out of storage, some nice white um, mycelial growth, fuzzy growth with um, a bunch of those black, looks like mouse droppings inside of them too those are the sclerotia so that's also part of the fungus and just liquid carrots lovely delicious that's sclerotinia this is gray mold gray mold's also a problem but it's it's not as um good at infecting as sclerotinia and sclerotinia can infect a whole bunch of hosts most vegetables a lot of fruits um, a bunch of ornamentals and it can almost infect basically any part if the conditions are right it can get in and it'll start infecting Gray mold is a necrotrope. It can only get in if something's broken or if it's dead. That's the only way it gets in. So all these carrots, the only, right, the only reason they have gray mold is because they have that stupid tail on there that's died off and it got on the tail or a bunch of broken carrots and it's got on there. So gray mold is definitely a secondary thing. It's a thing that um, uh, only really shows up if you have a lot of wounds and bruises and, and cracks and things like that. And maybe a variety or a year that has that that long tail uh, left on the tip of the carrot. So that's the difference. I'm going to spend most of the time on sclerotinia because that's the bigger one and we have options to control it. This one's sort of uh, a secondary thing to look out for. So what happens in storage actually starts here. This is the this is a picture on the side of the canopy. This is where all the storage rots are a problem. So this is August, September. Your canopy is closed. You have five six layers of old leaves down there they're starting to die off this is when you start to have the sclerotinia in there the white mycelial growth it's infecting the sort of dead and dying things and then it's moving its way down the crown and it's going into the crown of the carrot here right so it's killing the leaves that are all dead in the bottom of the canopy and it gets into the crown and that's what you take into storage and that's what's melting all the rest of the carrots in the box so this is really what we need to target um, there is a product that you can use if you drench it going into storage, but not, you know we're not washing carrots as they go into storage. So it's really managing in the field is where we need to focus on. 
So what's, what are bad field conditions? Really dense canopy. So right, right when that canopy closes, all of a sudden there's no sunlight, there's no air movement. And later on, like as we continue to grow the canopy, the old leaves fall down. It's wet, it's cool, um, high humidity. And that's what this disease loves, loves. So it just takes over um, in the canopy and then goes back into the, uh, uh, to the crown. So the easiest way to, I guess, manage it, especially in a non-chemical way, is just man manage your canopy a little bit. So once that canopy is closed, you're not going to get any fungicide in there. You know, it's, it's not going to penetrate all this dense canopy. Um, it's not magic droplets that's going to move its way around all the levels and, and get this dead and protect it here. It's just not going to happen. So once the canopy closes, you're really limited in what your fungicides can do for you. So early fungicide use, um, getting some good fungicides on white mold sclerotinia before the canopy closes, usually around August. Um, you can trim it. There's a bunch of work on this. This is pretty standard practice out in Eastern Ontario, or not in Ontario, sorry, Eastern Canada, where they have really high white mold pressure. Um, they almost all trim their canopies. Um, we did some work probably 10 years ago, almost maybe more now um, on work here. And, and it does work. You trim it back, you know, a quarter of the canopy. I'll show a little bit more on the next slide. Increases air movement, you know, it dries the canopy out. You got low humidity and you get less disease that you're taking into storage with you. Um, another thing that we're, I guess, to think about is, is we're not growing carrots for the canopy. Nobody's eating carrot leaf salad. Um, the above ground doesn't really matter as much. It's what's below the ground that really matters. So are we feeding nitrogen and foliar feeding to get a nice, beautiful, green, lush top? Or is that actually increasing our root mass? Or are we just leading to more storage issues because we have more sclerotinia that's going into the crown of the carrot? And so just something to keep in mind, some of the new varieties have, a, have really large canopies and not sure that's always a good thing, you know, at the end, if you're throwing out boxes of carrots that have melted away, is it really uh, worth it? So something to consider. Uh, harvesting cool, it's not a novel idea. Everybody knows that you got to bring it in cool, but um, really stress it. It seemed to be a problem. I have a, a slide, a couple of slides to go over that as well. But um, so it's, basically just trimming off the old leaves. So this is uh, a carrot trimmer that was built through that project uh, 10 years ago. Still around, still available, still adjustable. If you want to use it, it's free to use. Uh, you can adjust it to whatever your row spacings are and just rip through the field. Um, basically just cuts in between the canopy and opens it back up. So these, these cut leaves sort of dry, uh, fall down. They kind of dry up fairly quickly, especially if there's some good weather in August. Um, they dry up, they keep the weeds down. So you don't have to worry about spraying uh, herbicides anymore still. We found there's no yield loss like it's all the sort of the older dying leaves at the bottom. They're not really contributing much to yield anyway. So trimming these back just prevents them, uh, the white mold from infecting these old canopy leaves and moving into the, to the, um, to the crown of the carrot. It's not really affecting your yield. A lot of growers have mentioned also, it's easier to harvest at this point. You're not getting your, your points uh, bunged up with leaves and stuff like that. It, it just makes everything much easier when it comes to harvest time. Your points are just nicely on the side of the, the side of the hill. So uh, another maybe potential benefit. So this is, we, this is the trial that we did. We, we planted them nice and close together. Was it 28, 28, 26, oh, 26 inch spacing, I think um, with a big top on there. So we ripped through and you can see here, the mat of soil or uh, old leaves at the bottom starting to dry up. This dries up in a nice brown mat and just uh, hangs out there in the middle. You want to apply a fungicide again later in the season, right? Where it's a little cooler in September, but you got an ability to do so now where it's actually going to hit where you need it to, to protect these leaves in the crown, as opposed to just spraying the tops for a disease that's underneath it. So before, after, uh, something to consider. Uh, just to talk about some storage conditions as well. Um, cooler the soil, the better, of course. It's you know, closer to freezing without freezing the carrots, the better. Uh, if it's still warm out, we got to remove that field heat as quickly as possible, which means moving air through the boxes, cooling out the middle of the boxes so there's not hot spots, storing as close to zero as possible with high humidity. Uh, as high humidity as possible without free moisture. So as high as possible without 
actual water dripping down or making things wet, I guess is what you're looking for. This is uh, a lot of these slides. Sorry, Kevin, I almost forgot. A lot of these slides, thanks to Kevin. Kevin, thank you for these slides. These are all his slides he put together. Um, and these are all the harvest temperatures from, from last year. Um, so this is, I would say, you know, middle of October to middle of November, you know, pretty prime carrot harvesting um, weather. These are the, the air temps is the light blue and the soil temps is the dark blue, if you can see that. Um, so in our prime carrot harvesting weather, you know, our soil temps were between eight and 14 degrees Celsius. We did not have very cool. That's a lot of field heat to get to be taken out of boxes of carrots um, at this time of year. It wasn't until basically the last half of November where we started dropping down with, you know, minus three right here. I don't know, with minus five or six at some point, the, the third week of November, like you got some really cold snap at the end of November to drive the soil temperature down to where you sort of want to be harvesting carrots. And so I think a lot of the issues we're seeing this year is, is mainly due to this, is there so much field heat that we were not able to remove. And it just led to a lot of issues. So boxes in the middles that were just so warm that they're just great breeding grounds for disease because of these poor harvest conditions that we had last year. I'm gonna pull this up. I should have just left it up. Um, so same idea, uh, I gotta run through it again, that was dumb. So our main page, right? You go down here, you click on vegetable crop protection. Every single search that you're in can be saved. Uh, it's got a unique URL top. So if you just put in carrots here and say, I'm gonna skip again, and you have all the things on carrots, you can just save this up top and just bookmark it. And you'll always come back to the same, to the same page. If you only care about carrots ever, you can just keep coming back to the same page. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna type in sclerotinia white mole that pops up. I'm gonna look at everything that's registered. So we do have some fungicides registered that will work. This is probably the oldest one and the most, um, uh, one you're most familiar with is Allegro. Um, really good product, great product on white mold. Really important you get it in before the canopy closes. It has to be down there in the canopy around the crown and all those pedials to really work properly. Um, Contans, interesting product. Um, Bringing it back, I think, oh, Marika's is not here anymore. I think Bear picked it up or they, yeah, I think, anyways, um, biological products, you spread it on the ground and then it actually eats the sclerotia. All those mouse droppings of the actual fungus, this feeds on that. So you basically have to put it on the field when it's bare ground and then it'll eat the sclerotia that are in your field and reduce the populations. Interesting. There was some work done 10, 12 years ago as well from Mary Ruth's group and I believe they found that it worked and just, is it economical? I'm not too sure. Maybe if it's a new registrant or a little cheaper, I don't know. A um, couple other options are switch. So group nine to group 12, Luna Sensation and Merivis Duo. So Merivis is a um, suppression uh, product and the Luna is a newer one as well. So we have some options that you can include in the fungicide rotation um, that will work. See if we go down to view details um, for Allegro, similar idea, right? You can click for the label if you want, and there's all the information here. One thing I want to point out that we do have registered is Scholar. So Scholar is registered as a post-harvest dip slash drench. So again, not very feasible for what most growers are doing, but it's basically a, it's a treatment similar to what they do in potatoes, a post-harvest treatment that protects the outside of the carrots from anything that's in storage from, from spreading or getting in that you're bringing into storage. So I don't know if you can make this work. It's interesting. It works, but um, something to consider. Anyways, that's all I really had on that. If anybody has any questions on Asciello's or storage or white mold. Yeah, so this this one's a little weird where you have to actually dip it and it has to be drenched. In potatoes, it's all sprayed. So you've got to roll oil for conveyor or you have it somewhere that when, you're when they're dirty, it's a yeah, it's a dirty spray. Yeah. Into storage. Yes. Yeah. So it's uh it's an easier method of application for sure. Something I think we should probably be looking at maybe because it seems to work and very common in potatoes, but 
um, not not currently registered for carrots. Yeah. But yeah, you have a finger table or something. Um, you don't need to get too fancy. It just needs a drop of some kind and then a couple of nozzles. So, yeah. Any other questions for Dennis? Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Right, and there's also restrictions. It says domestic use, no export. Yeah, there's no US MRL, so yeah. There are some restrictions that do go in as well. Yeah. So if you do have, are you, if you are washing or if you have some pre-wash stuff that, you know, is really getting a problem, it's a, it's an option. Yep. So this makes uh, more of a comment. It's uh, one of the problems with the YouTube funds that are in here is that funders we don't get any. So um, it, it probably is hitting the, yeah. the, one, the next letter of the harvest and the different story of the in here. Yeah. Yeah. And last year was a dry fall, but we had a thick canopy early on when we had moisture. Yeah. So that's probably when it started. And then even though it dried up, the disease definitely. Yeah. You have rain pool there for that. So yeah. And then you're looking at Lycro, for instance, for uh, Scarabinia. Did it also, does it also talk about other? Does Lycro also have depression of the Lycro area? One of these, like, yeah, it will not when I click through it because we had selected. But if you uh, clear your selection, so if I go back and I do view edit and I clear my like what I'm specifically for, so you can add as many pests as you want to get really specific. If you just want everything, you just select nothing. And now I got to search for it. But yes, it'll have everything registered on there. So if I go to Luna, it'll show everything that's registered on Luna. So Sclerotinia powdery and Alternaria. Yeah. So as if you don't filter through, then it'll show everything available. So we have an online question, I think. Sorry, I missed it. Uh, good question. I don't know if there's been a lot of work on that. We do see them as early as June in the sticky cards. So I would assume that they're being attracted by stages even early June, which, you know, if you're seen in May, you're only a couple leaf stage at that point. So it's more of attractiveness as opposed to, to leaf stage as far as I know. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So next we have uh, Jeff Barikosh is going to give an update on uh, a video that we produced um, here at the research station for uh, carrot weevils. So he's, we're going to play that now. Um, so yeah, my name is Jeff. I'm a research technician here at the station. So most of the time I am working on the trials and writing the reports and whatnot. Um, but sometimes we get some different projects. This one was an alliance funded grant to kind of make these short educational videos uh, to try to touch on topics that might be of interest to growers here or growers producers here in the marsh. Um, so these are going to be on YouTube. We're going to send them out with the IPM updates and whatnot. So the goal isn't to make ad revenue money or clickbait titles. Uh, they're really for the people in this room. Uh, so we're going to hand around a little questionnaire of short sorts because we'd like to hear, you know, what topics are you most interested in? Um, how long should they be? Who do you want to hear from? Uh, any other comments at all? So this is a video uh, Dennis, Tyler, and I made last year just as kind of a test. And then we're hoping to make another seven or eight videos this year. Um, so yeah, hopefully you enjoy it. It's about five minutes long. And let me turn up the light here so you can see it better. Carrot weevil is one of the most damaging pests facing Ontario carrot growers today. They overwinter in the soil and plant residue, and then lay their eggs on the carrot crowns in the spring. Once hatched, the larvae eat through the root, causing the carrot to be unmarketable or killing it altogether. This tricky little pest has developed resistance to all kinds of insecticides and has even adapted their egg laying period to get around current management practices. Today, we're gonna to have Tyler Blau, the IPM coordinator here at the station, talk about when you should be spraying to maximize efficiency and minimize costs, and then we're gonna have Dennis Van Dyke, the OMAF for carrot specialist, talk about what are the best products to be using to control carrot weevil in 2022. We start scouting for carrot weevils early in the season, even before carrots are seeded, to try and monitor the high pressure early seeded carrots may face. And to scout for carrot weevils, we use these wooden Boyvin weevil traps, which we place out in all of our fields. And if you're interested in learning how to make your own trap, check out the link below. 
So the number of weevils that we catch per trap correlates to the amount of pressure each carrot field may face. Generally, when we're scouting our carrot fields, we set out four traps per field, which we view as two groups of two. And early in the season, we like to place our traps around the borders of the fields near sheltered areas. And as the carrots are seeded, we move the traps in a few rows. Our IPM program scouts each carrot field twice a week. And when we go to each field, we count the number of weevils that we capture and we replace each trap with a new fresh carrot bait. So let's see how many weevils we can catch today. So I'm at the fourth weevil trap here. In the previous three, I caught two weevils and here I caught one more. So that gives us a total of three weevils in this field today. And we represent this number as a current weevils per trap count. So because I caught three weevils and we have four traps out here in this field, our current weevils per trap count is 0.75. So we have two spray thresholds that we use for care weevil pressure. And both of them are based off of a cumulative weevils per trap count. So our first spray threshold is 1.5 cumulative weevils per trap. And if you reach this threshold, we recommend you spray at the second true leaf stage. Our second spray threshold is five cumulative weevils per trap. So if you're near or surpass five cumulative weevils per trap, we also recommend that you spray at the fourth true leaf stage. So if all of this is a little bit confusing to you um, and you are a grower here in the Holland Marsh, please feel free to, to go onto our website and contact one of us uh, to, to sign up for our IPM mailing list. Um, and we send out an IPM report twice a week, um, sharing our recommendations on care weevil pressure. So we now know when we should spray for care weevils, and now we need to figure out what we should spray. So if you are seeing high carrot weevil pressure in your fields uh, from scouting, the main management technique is insecticide spraying. So the main insecticide used over the past 40 years has been Imidan it's, uh, or Fosmet. It's a group 1B organophosphate insecticide. So in the early 2010s, we were seeing increasing populations of carrot weevils in fields. We were seeing uh, more and more damage at harvest due to carrot weevil. Uh, so work done by the University of Guelph in 2017 to 2019 has found resistance to imidan in those Hallmars populations of weevils, which would explain those increasing damage we were seeing. Uh, luckily though, there is some two newer insecticides uh, that do work uh, on carrot weevil. So one of those would be uh, XRL or cyanotranilaprol. It's a group 28 insecticide in the, the diamide family. Uh, this product should work on most life stages of the carrot weevil. Uh, from eggs, larvae, and adults. Uh, another one uh, is Rimon or Rimon. It's a novel uron. It's a group 15 insecticide. What's interesting about this one is that it only works on early life stages. It does not have any efficacy on adults. So it prevents those early life stages from progressing to the next stage. So it would prevent eggs from hatching and going to larvae and larvae from uh, continuing to progress. In terms of timing these two products, it's very similar to what growers would have used for Imidan. So you're looking at sort of the two, four leaf stage in terms of timing, right? When you're sort of seeing peak egg laying and peak activity of weevils in the field. Uh, there is another group uh, of insecticides, uh, group three synthetic pyrethroids, uh, Lambda Cyhalothrin. Has a couple different trade names, Matador, uh, Silencer, Labamba are some common ones. Um, in those efficacy trials in 2017 to 2019, uh, there wasn't a lot of efficacy for this, potentially because of resistance developing in those populations as well. Uh, but you may see better efficacy in other regions of Ontario. As care weevils continue to adapt and evolve, a lot of research goes into finding the best new methods and products to help support growers. If you want to learn more about care weevil management, there will be links down below in the description to trials done here at the station and other useful information like the OMAFRA control updates. If you have any questions, comments, or other topics you'd like to see covered in a future video, please leave a comment down below or contact us here at the station. Anyways, thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Anne McCray, I'm with BASF. I'm the technical service specialist uh, for all of our horticulture products and uh, insecticides. So I'm going to give a bit of a carrot and onion update just because I'm just here the one day. So I'm gonna kind of cover both, um, but mostly just talking about one product in particular, uh, which would be Marivon, which is our fungicide that is registered for a number of fruit and vegetable crops, uh, as well as both onions and carrots. 
So Marivon is our sort of newest fungicide that's been registered about two years ago. It combines a group 11, which is paraclistrobin, which has been on the market for a number of years. And many of you would be familiar with it as Cabrio or Pristine or Cabrio Plus or Headline. Um, it's a very strong uh, product in our portfolio just because of the plant health benefits that it provides. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But also Marivon uh, has Zemium, and Zemium is our newest group seven. Uh, it's highly systemic as in it moves upwards through the plant, not backwards, but locally systemic. It also combines to the waxy cuticles, so it stays, it has a quick rain fast essentially once it dries. Um, and so it's been a very strong uh, fungicide in our portfolio, so the two of them together make a great combination. So as I said, um, Marivon is registered for a number of, number of vegetable crops. I'll speak to bulb vegetables and root vegetables, but it's also registered for leafy and cucurbits as well. So specific to root vegetables or carrots, uh, we have a pretty broad label. We cover alternaria, powder mildew, and cercospora more for the... Um, beets and things like that. Um, we have a rate range. Generally, it's a 0.3 to 0.4. So we usually say if you have high disease pressure, then go for that higher rate. Um, but we've done many trials and that 0.3 works really well for the most part. But if you get in those years when you get rare, really high pressure, I'd always say go with the high rate. The pre-harvest interval is seven days and re-entry is 12 hours. And of course, this is a group seven and there are a number of products on the market that are group seven and 11. So we always recommend you make sure you're rotating your chemistries. So you wouldn't use any more than three or four uh, group sevens throughout the season uh, and no more than two sequentially. Uh, for bulb vegetables, so for onions specifically, this would be the product that we would recommend for stem philium. I know stem philium is the number one disease on everybody's mind when it comes to onions. Uh, it is suppression, so but I most things are. It's fair. I don't know if you can say strong suppression because it's not controlled, but but we've had good efficacy uh, with Marivon, and so we've often recommended that. It'll also cover control of purple blotch and your and botrytis as well. So if for onions, I generally recommend the high rate, the 0.6, because most people are looking for to get as much stem philium control as you can. Uh, so that would be the recommendation. But if it's uh, for purple blotch, then the 0.4 liter per hectare rate looks really good. Um, and again, uh, same story with this is a group seven. So make, make sure you're trying to rotate those chemistries. So, and as I mentioned before about uh, Marivon containing paraclistrobin, it has that those plant health benefits, which we've um, done many, many studies to show kind of how it affects different crops. This one, this study was done specific to onions, um, looking actually at the bulb diameter when you apply uh, a product like Marivon because it has paraclistrobin. It just, it reduces the stress of the plant and gives it an opportunity to grow to its full potential, essentially. Um, this uh, also, we've seen uh, great yield increases in carrots and helping with uh, top strength and things like that. So uh, with both crops, uh, that sort of plant health benefits, it really uh, adds to your yield every year. Um, and so just switching gears a little bit to Circadus, uh, if you are sort of trying to build your spray program and you want, you don't like having products that have two modes of action and you want to be able to choose your modes of action, Circadus is an excellent option. It's just a group seven. It's the same group seven that is in Marivon. So we do recommend that for things like stem philium, stem philium and onions or alternaria and carrots. Uh, it's an excellent product and it has that single mode of action. So it gives you that flexibility. So I just wanted to, that was just a quick overview of some of our fungicides, but I wanted to add my contact information as well as uh, Chelsea Steenbergen is the new horticulture rep for Ontario. So she would be your sales rep. 
So if you need to reach out to her to ask any questions, or if you have any technical questions at all, you can come see me today or uh, give me a call or send me an email. So thanks very much for letting me speak for a few minutes. <laughs> Okay, as always, I'm up to talk about the carrot variety trial that we conducted here at the Muck Station in uh, 2022. <clears throat> so I seeded the trial on May 24th. We had 35 varieties this year from six different companies. Uh, we did the harvest from the 17th to the 21st of October. We did the evalu evaluations, or I did the evaluations from the 6th of November through the 24th of November. Some just observations from the trial this year. Uh, I did apply irrigation, and it was, it was a bit on the dry side in May, and I put a little bit of water on just to kind of help them get them up and going and just kind of keep them moving along a little bit. So we did that a few times. Uh, had good stand counts and vigor. The plants were quite good this year. Uh, had a super low amount of weevil damage. I don't know if other growers have had that experience or not, but this year at the station, we had like, there was barely anything found and we'll see a little uh, comment on that in a, in a bit. Uh, I would say average yields as a whole. It, was, it, was, it wasn't a phenomenal year, but average yields. Moderate incidence of cavity spot. And I have a, a slide about that in a little bit. There was very low levels of blight. Uh, I stopped spraying, I believe it was around the 24th of August and just kind of let the carrots go because we always want to do a rating for blight and blight resistance in, in the carrot varieties. And this year when I went to do that in October there, there was some blight, but even I'll use it, Fontana was still in quite decent shape. And usually it falls apart pretty quickly. So uh, average lengths overall, and the color was good this year, although this year I did see a slight return compared to the last few years of a little bit of marbling in some of the carrot varieties, but not a lot, just a tiny little bit. Looking at percent marketable, uh, in the cellos, the trial average was 75, and in the jumbos, it was basically about 75 also. It ranged from 83 to 65 in the cellos and 85 to 60 in the uh, jumbos. The cellos actually increased by about 10% compared to the 2021 variety trial, but the jumbos actually decreased about 1%. So looking at the top varieties that sort of come out of those 35 varieties in the cellos, Brilliance was the best one from Stokes at 83%. And in the jumbos, uh, Calton from Seminova at 85.4%. Naval and Speedo. Uh, Speedo, just so you know, it's the second year that it was one of the top four as far as percent marketable goes in the trial. Uh, Orange Blaze and Cicero uh, from Seminis and from Ville Moran in the Cellos and the Jumbos. And again, Orange Blaze too, it's the second year that it was in the top, hot, top percentages of percent marketable coming out of the variety trial. And finally, just the last number four is Trophy Pack from Stokes at 80 and Extremo from Vilmoran, and again, second year that Extremo was in the top part there as far as percent marketable goes. Looking at yield, uh, the trial average was about 1,037. So again, okay. It ranged from uh, 771 variety to 1419 and another variety. Now the 1419 will be more of a jumbo type variety, obviously. Uh, this year, actually, it increased by 40 bushels compared to the 2021 trial. When I was harvesting it, I didn't think I would see that. But when I started doing the data, that came shining through. Uh, in the jumbos, the trial average was about 11, and it ranged from uh, 900 to 1,500. And it, it actually decreased this year by about 40 bushels. And I think that mostly is just in the jumbo varieties, I noticed that the size wasn't quite 100% there. They were a little bit more on the smaller size this, this year. The best varieties as far as yield went in the trial, Brilliance from Stokes at 14.19 and Belgrado, not surprisingly, at 15.29. Nevado and Berlin. Uh, Nevado has been in the top yielding ones for the cello types for the last four years. And Berlin has been for the last three years as far as uh, jumbo types go. 
Naval and Baldito from Bejo at 1322 and 1385, his third top highest yielding carrots for those two types. And finally, Istanbul and Bastia. And Bastia, again, third year, it's been in that top four range as far as yield goes for the jumbo types. Looking at oversize, so oversize for us is anything over an inch and three quarters in that top crown area, approximately. So in the cellos, Orange Blaze had the most amount of oversize. So more of a, if you want to call it, came out more of a jumbo or cello jumbo mix type of an idea in there. Orange Blaze had the best at 42% of them. Trophy Pack, Jefferson, and the trial average was 27.7 overall. So these guys were just a little bit better. In the jumbos, where you want them to be larger, obviously, you want that to be well over that size. The varieties that had the best percentage of being that inch and three quarters or greater um, was Extremo, Catalino, Bravia, and the trial average was 60.1, which you're, of course, wanting a higher percentage. In the cellos and jumbos, actually increased both of them the percentage wise compared to 2021. So, in one sense, there was a slightly increased number of oversize, but yet in the jumbos, the yield was down a little bit. So how that all worked out, I don't know. Maybe it was a little bit on the length, was, we're losing it on the weight that way. I, I'm not too sure. Looking at scores, or basically now looking at the quality of the carrots. So that's all based on the uniformity of shape and length and width, appearance, internal, external, color, light, resistance to green. The trial average was 6.75 or considered average. It ranged from 5.81 to 8.29. Quality was slightly better in the cellos, which is a little bit different than what I normally see. Normally, I find the jumbos have a little better quality, usually because the skins are more smoother. They're kind of more, almost a little more finished off. But this year was sort of the opposite. The cellos actually were a little better in quality than the jumbos were. But the six cultivars that had the highest scores or the better qualities in the cellos, Naval from Bejo. And in Jumbo Cicero, both of this, these are really, I, mean, I don't know how good it comes up on the screen, but they were like really smooth. They were very even overall. So you could really see there was a quality there type of thing when we were, when I was doing the evaluations. Narvac and Catalino from Seminova and from Bejo up there, again, 7.52, uh, 7.10. Anything really from seven and up is, is considered pretty good when you're doing the evaluations on the carrots. And Brilliance from Stokes and Speedo at seven as far as the jumbo type goes. And again, here Speedo's the second year in a row that it was up there as far as score goes or quality issues go. Cavity spot. So the trial this year, I had 60.5% of the carrots had a cavity spot on them or more with a light medium lesion as a general size of those cavity spots. It ranged from one variety only having 23 of the carrot, 23% of the carrots having a cavity spot on them with a light lesion. So a light lesion just to, uh, for refresher is anything about one to two millimeters in size to one variety having 78% of the carrots having a cavity spot with a medium to heavy size lesion. That's about a, a three to five millimeter lesion on it. Uh, 20, it was actually a, this was a, I shouldn't say surprising, but there was actually a 23% decrease in the percentage of carrots infected with cavity spot compared to 2021. But the actual uh, light medium sized lesions was pretty much the exact same as what I saw in 2021. So it just was less carrots seemed to be affected. The only thing that I did notice this year was I had a carrot, it would be completely clean, but then the carrot that might have some cavity spot on it, I did find an increased number of individual spots on a carrot. So maybe in 2021, I might've had one or two lesions on a carrot root. This year, I might've had three or four lesions on a carrot root. So the actual number of lesions on the root bumped up, but the percentage of carrots infected was actually lower if you can follow all that. But the top cultivars with the lowest percentage of cavity spot, uh, Volcano, and it's the fourth year that Volcano has been in that top range. Bloro, Cicero, Naval. Naval has been in there for eight years as always having, when in the consistency of the carrot variety trials, always having the lowest cavity spot. And then a number variety from Illinois, Illinois Seed Company, uh, 17663. So we're ranging again, 23% of the carrots was just a light lesion, a one to two millimeter lesion. 
to 52% of the carrots with a, a light lesion. And again, the trial average was 60% of the carrots with a light to medium sized lesion overall. So these varieties are sh show some tolerance towards cavity spot for sure, especially in the vowel over eight years, always being within that top five, more or less from the variety trials. Weevil and rust fly. So um, I know in Dennis's video or the video that ran there, they talked a bit about some of the products being used for um, weevil control now. So previously in 2017, 2016, 2015, 2014, it was a battle trying to control weevil and we weren't having a whole heck of a lot of success. When the product started getting registered, you can see things kind of drop down. Now, 2020, there's a little bit of a blip up here. I think that would have been very comparable to the zero or very low percentages. But in 2020, this is just as important thing maybe for growers. I missed my timing of application here. I messed up when I put it on. I did not get it on at the right timing. And that year I saw a bit of damage. So it's very important to kind of follow the recommendations uh, passed on from IPM and making sure you're doing your applications in that timely manner. Because as again, I messed up, I think if I'm not mistaken, I kind of, I think I hit one spray, I sort of missed one. And by the time I put the third one on, I was kind of past the window of getting really decent control of the weevils. But this year, the trial average for weevils was only 0.1%. So there is literally only a few carrots of all the carrots that I looked at that I found any type of weevil damage on. And as far as rust flies, I had about a half a percent of damage. So rust fly two was not too bad at all for me, at least at the station this year. We did do a few sprays, which are in the green book you can see to try to control rust fly. And Tyler, the rust fly was not too bad at the station. Am I right on that? It wasn't too bad, yeah, this year. So our numbers, even just maybe in our little pocket here, weren't super bad. So that also is a factor for us too. But it does show that the new products really do offer a lot of really good protection. Moving on to adaptation trial. So adaptation are carrot varieties that the seed companies have kind of coming up, coming, working up into the system. They might just want to try it out, see how it performs on muck, things like that. So we had... Uh, five varieties this year. So the top three, as far as percent marketable, all basic, uh, a numbered variety from Illinois Seed Company at 72% of them being marketable, Nagasaki from uh, Beijo, and another numbered variety from Illinois also. And looking at yield, uh, you can kind of see too, this is more of a, a jumbo type of a carrot from Illinois Seed Company at about a thousand. Uh, the other one, I believe it was more of a packaging type carrot. And then again, another type of jumbo. So yields usually in the adaptation also are usually a little lower than the variety trial. Sometimes the quality of seed isn't quite there. This is new stuff that they're kind of coming up with or trying to see how it performs. So we don't, not surprising to see a slightly decrease in yields. And as far as score or qualities, uh, a colored carrot for Red Sun from Beijo actually had the best quality. And then two numbered varieties from Illinois Seed Company still being at a pretty decent rating for quality, quite nice. And they both were, again, sort of more of a jumbo type carrot. So not surprising to see a little better quality there from those. Looking at the storage trial. So in uh, 2021, 2022, so these are actually 2021 carrots that I popped into the storage in October of that year. And then we looked at them in around June-ish of this year. We had 36 varieties that went in. We had them from eight different companies. The storage terms about 38 weeks, give, take, some weeks either side. As far as some highlights of it goes, the percent marketable range from 93 to 43. Uh, the weight loss range from 13 to 23. That was a fairly bit of an increase compared to what I've seen from the previous year's storage trial. The decay range from 6.7 to 56. And it also was a bump, quite a bump up compared to what I had from the 2020 storage trial. Uh, they stored fair, but it was unequal between varieties. So we had some varieties that stored quite well and some varieties that completely tanked. Uh, the top sprouting was also a concern. So I didn't have a lot of root sprouts coming out on them, but top sprouts were pretty long and pretty aggressive on most of the varieties out there. So the ones that came out the best as far as percent marketable when the storage trial was said and done, Istanbul from Beijo at 93.4. You can kind of see too some of the top sprouts there in the in the pictures. You'll see them. Uh, sell a bunch, 
from Stokes at 88.4. Again, this is second year that they've been in that top six. Jefferson, a variety from Bejo at 83. Naval from Bejo at 82. A number variety from Norseco, 53.11 at 81.7. And a number variety from Seminus, 59.34 at 81.7 also. And then just, again, the marketable carrots and then the ones that had some type of issue. And even in here, just so you're aware too, if it's at the tip, if there's a canker on it, depending, it goes into the rot category. So some of the rot could be heavily infected or some of it can just be getting going that it would be something that you'd have to either break off or it's gone into the actual carrot itself. As far as weight loss, of course, you don't want to have much weight loss, but the trial average was 18.4. It was about a 7% increase compared to the previous year. So we did lose more weight this past year in storage. I really don't, um, can't say specifically, I would know why, but I do know that in several of the varieties we noticed um, more shrinkage, more wrinkling up, drying out. So some of that, that was a bit of a concern. Uh, oops. So the best variety, as far as I go, is Caral from Illinois at 13%, 0.7% weight loss, Brilliance, Volcano, a number of variety from Pure Line Seeds, and the number of variety from Norseco, losing basically 15% for those other ones there, ballpark. In Decay, so the trial average was 26.4. That was up 18% compared to the previous year. I do think that the 2020 carrots stored really well. 2021 is stored okay. Um, and I, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of the storage for this year's 2022 carrots. Because I know when um, we were having some scouting, and I know, that, I know there's been a lot of talk lately also about sclerotinia and some issues with carrots and storage this year as a whole for you guys. I do know that in June, June, I think it was, Tyler, correct me if I'm wrong, we were finding a little bit of sclerotinia starting, or was it July? July, okay, July on the station. I did use some of the products that were registered. It seemed to kind of nip it in the butt. When we went in and did the harvest, uh, we have to get on the ground and harvest uh, hand samples. I only found one or two very small pockets of sclerotinia, so I didn't see a lot. But the yield samples that we took I washed them and did the evaluation, put them back in storage. And when I got them out now for getting ready for today and tomorrow, there was a ton of sclerotinia in there. A lot of those carrots, you know, being washed, that doesn't help. But a lot of those carrots were quite heavily infected. I didn't see that at evaluation, but it looks like over time. So it'll be interesting to see how the carrots this year actually hold up. But those that had the least amount from the 2021 Istanbul, at only about 7% infection with some type of rot, sell a bunch, Jefferson, Naval, and 59.34 at, uh, at about 18%. The, you see too, a little more so the packaging ones. In the packaging for my evaluations in the packaging trial, we usually find more of a tip rot. And in the jumbos, we usually find more of a, of a canker or a crater rot usually occurring. So. Okay, so I've just kind of flown through all this stuff and given a, a real brief highlight of it. Everything is, of course, the back third of the green book is all the variety trial stuff. There is, of course, even more observation notes and data that was collected. There's also a comment section on each of the varieties and also on the storage trials. There's some long-term averages. So definitely take, oh, and all the management practices, when I sprayed, what I sprayed, fertilizers that I did, uh, applications, irrigation, all that type of stuff. So please take some time to go through and give, look at things even more in depth. It's there for you. And of course, just a little reminder, I don't know if anybody's mentioned this yet today, but we do have our webpage. All the past green books are on there research reports, research trials from Mary Ruth, um, and some other information. So definitely take some time, take a look on the thing. And as Jeff was up mentioning before, we have a, a YouTube channel now. We're moving into the 21st century or whatever, but we have a YouTube channel and they're working really hard at getting some grower informational videos going on there. So please take some time to look at that. The past uh, conferences, a couple of those are on there. We load up the variety trial information on there as much as possible. And then, of course, uh, we also have Twitter through the IPM, which is more geared to just putting out little quick shots of information as far as 
rust flies are super high this week in the northern part of the marsh or don't forget the muck conferences tomorrow or things like that so it's not we're not super active on twitter but we're putting out little shots of information whenever need be and then of course um mishko is a, you guys probably all have met mishko many many times and I had a summer student, Samantha share. So they basically helped me run the variety trial and, and gather the information and, and do all the work. Uh, Samantha was a great summer student this year. And Mishko, just so everybody knows, Mishko has retired. He has decided to retire. So he will not be back for this coming season. And uh, he's a great loss. He was a great guy for as far as anything mechanical and things like that, he could fix anything. So it's going to definitely be a bit of a hit for us here. We'll have to try our best, but we do appreciate everything that Mishko did over all the years and helping out. And he was a great uh, co-worker and we're, we're definitely going to miss him. So, okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Sean. Any questions for Sean before we move on? Nothing online. We're good. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Thank you. So our next presentation is uh, Neem Paddy. He's a graduate student uh, in Mary's program, and he's going to give us an update on uh, cover crops and uh, and soil health. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present on cover cropping and soil health for mock soil or organic soil. And yeah, after onions and carrots are harvested at Holland Mass, if the field is left uncovered, there is high chance of losing soil because of wind erosion during uh, late fall and uh, winter and like early spring. So like our main objective here is to keep the soil covered so that we, we, uh, we prevent losing soil due to wind erosion and for that we are trying uh, to uh, we, we 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 are doing trial to determine uh, the best cover crop after onion and carrot rotation and at the same time we are also evaluating different methods of establishing cover crop after late carrot harvest and next part of our research is focused on soil health we are trying to determine or establish baseline information for soil health of mock soil and yeah basically maybe all of you are aware like what cover crops are cover crops are simply any crops that are grown outside of normal growing season there are many there may be different objectives of growing cover crop in the field and there are also different advantages of growing cover crop in the field and but our main objective here to go grow cover crop is to reduce soil loss due to wind erosion. And some of the major cover crops that are being grown at Holland Mars are barley, fall rye, tillage radish, oats, sorghum. And yeah, we did a trial on cover crop after onions are harvested. And we, we did run that trial in RCBD design with four treatments and four applications. We tried on barley, uh, barley radish mix, uh, diacon radish, and nitro mix. And her nitro mix is the mixture of six different species, which includes legumes, cereal grains, and radish. So we seeded cover crop after onions were harvested. Uh, we seeded them on September 22nd, and we assessed cover crop growth on November 9th. And for assessment, we measured uh, canopy coverage, plant counts, fresh weight, and dry weight. And what we found was barley and barley radish mix did good job when compared to the nitro plus and diacon radish. Uh, variables measure was significantly high, especially for canopy coverage, plant counts, and dry weight for barley and barley radish mix. So yeah, the, here is the picture showing the canopy coverage here is the picture of barley radish mix and barley although like barley radish mix had slightly higher canopy coverage when compared to barley there wasn't significant difference between them and the picture was taken on november 9th
And yeah, th this is the picture for, of diacon radius and nitro mix. The, the canopy coverage was a little bit lower, significantly lower than barley and barley radius mix for these two species or species mix. Yeah, another trial was conducted on cover crop after carrots, and it was run. It was also done in same design with four treatments and four replications. Four treatments used were barley, uh, pre-harvest barley, fall rye, and with no cover crop. Here, pre-harvest barley is means we seeded barley seed in the standing carrot cover crop, and we did use a higher seeding rate for that. We use like double the seed rate we use for uh, we use for uh, barley seeded after carrots were harvested. Yeah, those who were seeded, a uh, pre-harvest barley was seeded on September 28th on the standing cover crop and other treatments, barley and fall rye after carrots were seeded uh, on October 7th. And assessment was done on November 11th. And yeah, same assessment as canopy covers, plant counts, press weight and dry weight was done. And what we found was although like tree harvest barley had significantly high canopy coverage, plant counts, face weight, and dry weight when compared to other treatments. Yeah, this is how the field looked like. Yeah, uh, this is uh, this is a pre-harvest barley seeded one week before carrots were harvested, and barley after after carrots and fall rye after carrots look similar in uh, in terms of canopy coverage. Yeah, we also run another another small plot trial to evaluate more cover crop species. And at the same time, we also try to evaluate other methods that could be useful in establishing cover crop after carrots, especially. So for that, we, we tried with seed priming and uh, barley plugs. By seed priming, we mean like uh, it means uh, hydrating the seed before they are actually seeded in the field so that it completes a first stage of generation before going to the field so that it can germinate quicker than the other non prime seed. And, and, and yeah, for priming, we use two types of priming. We, we prime seed in water, just water. We soak the seed for 24 hours in water, left it to dry overnight before seeding. And another method was we use, instead of water, we use potassium nitrate solution uh, at five gram per liter rate to see its effect. And we did the same way. The priming was the same way, 24 hours of soaking and leaving it to dry overnight. And for, uh, for, uh, for preparing uh, barley transplants, barley were seeded in a uh, seeding tray and two seeds per, uh, per hole or per pot of the seeding tray was seeded and it was seeded on September 9th. And, and uh, the, the treatments were applied in the field on October 14th and assessment was done on November 15th before like frost appear or frost kill the cover crop. So this is the result we got in the same assessment as before we did for all the treatments. And what we found was barley plugs did best job in terms of canopy coverage, plant counts, fresh weight and dry weight. And, and among other treatments, among like seeded treatments, uh, barley was the one like we did best job when compared to other species. However, it was only significant, dif significantly different with oats and prime oats and triticale. Yeah, these are the pictures of, of th these are the pictures from our, our trial and the pictures are arranged in a way like, uh, like this, this barley plugs had highest canopy coverage while the oats had like lowest canopy coverage. And also uh, what we found was barley among seeded treatment barley had highest canopy coverage while like if we look at our priming treatments they did not do well when compared to on prime seed except for oats for oats it was slightly higher canopy coverage when compared to on prime but for other like 
primacy did not do better in terms of canopy coverage and other variables measured. Yeah, this picture is from uh, fall. This picture is from 2021 trial of 2021 cover crop trial after carrots. Here, like the 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 field, the the plant in the field is like fall rye, which was seeded after carrots were harvested in 2021, and the picture was taken on 2022 uh, April. So what what we what I am trying to show here is like if what if we use winter species as a cover crop after carrots, then usually like uh, we we plant or we seed onions after carrots are harvested next season. So if we have winter species as a cover crop, then it may interfere with onion seeding or onion planting next year, which may delay, yeah, which may which may delay in onion onion planting seeding. Yeah, the, some of the conclusion we we got from our cover crop trial after onions and carrots were barley, radish mixture or simply barley could be the best cover crop after onions in terms of canopy coverage or wind erosion control. Pre-harvest broadcasting of barley at high rate before carrots harvest could be used for fall establishment of the cover crop. And barley transfer, we, we found like barley transplants were effective as a cover crop after carrots in terms of canopy coverage, but uh, but cost or other 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 additional tools we require for barley transplant to prepare barley transplant and and plant them in the field is a point to consider here. And like yeah, seed priming did not improve the emergence of the cereal cover crop. So, however, like we will repeat the, all these experiments this year also, and like we 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 will come to more concrete result, like how how all these work or how what should we conclude from our research trial. Yeah, another aspect of my research is on soil health, and and through this research, the the question we are trying to answer is like if standard soil health test we do in mineral soil also works for uh, also works in the organic soil or mock soil, which has like very high organic matter because uh, because uh, uh, results from the soil health test done in mineral soil like so that organic matter is like most important soil health indicator in this most most important soil health indicator. But yeah, there is a question like if if organic matter is most important soil health indicator for mock soil, which has like very high high amount of organic matter up to 80%. So yeah, for, uh, for our soil health trial, we did soil sampling and for soil sampling, we collected soil from 15 different carrot fields. And the, the, the way we, cal we collected soil sample is we, uh, we, 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 uh, uh, we, we took, uh, four, four 10 by 10 blocks from each field and two blocks which are near to the road. We, like we, we collected two sub samples from each field and samples were collected from four different blocks uh, in the field of the size 10 by 10 meter square. And sample one was, uh, sample one was uh, made by, by combining samples from these two blocks which are near to the road and second sample was uh, second sample was made by by mixing the soil samples taken from these two blocks which are like farther from the road so uh, and like after carrots were matured we also took carrot samples from the same place from from the same blocks where the where the soil samples were collected and we we took productivity data and we categorized the fields into different types in terms of productivity high me, uh, low medium and high and and we by our categorization we found like four 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 fields were low productive eight were medium and three were high And we sent our soil samples to ANL lab, and they do. Uh, we 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 did 
vitalus soil health test three test and that test does soil uh, soil physical and chemical properties test which shows uh, amount of uh, different macro and micronutrients in the soil along with soil ps cation exchange capacity and at the and also uh, they also do like soil bio biological test which shows like um, abundance of different uh, beneficial bacteria or fungi in the soil so yeah this 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 these pictures are just uh, just taken from the soil health report they provide us from uh, anl lab and yeah the preliminary result like we we combined uh, uh, the results we got from uh, anl lab and we did a preliminary analysis of the results we got from there and what we found was uh, magnesium, cation exchange capacity, calcium, boron, total gram negatives, total bacteria, pseudomonas population, nitrogen fixers, and iron is important soil health indicator. And, and like we did further, uh, like uh, uh, what, what we found was magnesium, cation exchange capacity, calcium, and boron was relatively lower in high productive soil. And other 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 indicator were like relatively higher in high productive soil, but but the difference wasn't significant in terms statistically significant. The relative number was higher in those uh, with uh, arrow facing upward and lower in those red arrows. And we also like we also checked like if if. Those indicators are related are related with the productivity data we take from our carrot field, and we found no significant correlation of those indicators with productivity. Yeah, we are, we have also sent our soil samples to another lab. It's Harvest Genomics. They do uh, they do microbiome analysis of soil, and it shows like abundance of bacteria, fungi, and umises in the soil. So. We are still waiting for the result from that lab and maybe like result from that lab. So it's like more, yeah, help to help come us to like more concluding, uh, concluding point. And moreover, like we'll be doing more soil health assessment from uh, more, more soil health assessment this year also. Uh, we'll be taking more soil samples from more other fields and see like how, how how the result will be however the results shown here are just a preliminary one so yeah there is there is there's more to do more to come there is more analysis need to be done to come to like concrete result about soil health information of the mock soil yeah that's all and i would like to acknowledge my advisors and technicians and funding partners yeah to make uh, this is just happen thank you all right thank you neem are there any questions for neem yes yeah i i just used it was done in a small plot trial and i just used a hand seeder to plant that yeah because of water they just become a little bit bigger than the originally how 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 big they were and yeah yeah it, yeah, the germination percentage was a little bit lower in case of uh, in case of prime seed. I don't know why. We we I have tried the same experiment in greenhouse also, and seen a little bit lower, not that much, but little bit lower germination percentage in prime seed. And yeah, but but like uh, when I went to the field and see the emergence of the seed after I think. Two weeks, like we, we can see the difference in biomass between uh, primed and unprimed. Prime seed were a little bit bigger than when compared to the unprimed seed. The, the, 
the reason they did not work was because of uh, germination percentage. In terms of biomass, if we compare same number of the plants of primed and unprimed seed, then the biomass would was higher for prime seed. They were bigger. Any other questions? Yep. Is there a benefit to the soil if you spray the cover crop down as opposed to working it in? Like if you spray your cover crop down, is there any benefits to the soil? So that's like nutrients or is, is you mean instead of seeding with the seed drill, does it spray or like if uh so say I got a late crop plant and I plant cover crop first. And I spray that covered crop, crop down with uh, Roundup. Uh, Is there any benefit to the soil from that covered crop after it's been sprayed? Yeah, I'm not like 100% sure, but yeah, because it's, it's complex, because when, when there is cover crop in the field, uh, for example, if you think of nitrogen, nitrate, it takes off that nitrate from the soil. So when 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 cover crop took nitrate from the soil, then there is less chance of losing that nitrogen due to losing uh, due to leaching from that soil. So yeah, this way we can um, we can like prevent, for example, nitrate from losing of soil losing from the soil. And other than that, uh, biomass due to Cover crop can add uh, can add properties can add soil organic matter and yeah can can uh, can can improve soil soil health of the. No. 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 Any other questions, Dennis? Do you um, when would you feel the, the the carrot one where you spread it, spread it and then harvest it? You spread, you spread it like a week before you harvest the carrots. You went in and harvest all the carrots, and then did you disc it afterwards? Did you roll it? Did you just leave it? Like what other prep did you do after you harvested the carrots? I think that's really good. Yeah, I guess like yeah, I I I broadcast it. Uh, barley seed in the standing carrot crops. Then the carrots were harvested with the carrot harvester. And after that, I think we left the field as, as it is. No, yeah, yeah. The only thing we did was run over with the roller because we rolled everything oh, okay. that we seeded. So we didn't do any cultivation. Okay. And like Neem said, we did broadcast that at a really high rate, but it it did come up and it was but it was harvested the yeah. first week of october so it was it was earlier than lots of other people harvested carrots but we were surprised with how well it actually did establish so like within a couple of days after we were done pretty much so yeah Yes. So it was. Yeah, because we tried that the year before. We put it on in August and tried to get them growing up in between the rows, but that didn't really. Um, that didn't really work because there wasn't enough sunlight. So we did get some things to germinate, but then they kind of got shaded out. Um, yeah, the issues is of the carrot tops. I know everyone likes to work them under. Um, so yeah, that's the. But yeah, we didn't do any post harvest. The one pass I did because I didn't know if to disc up in time, but mm -hmm. and the other ones we only disc twice and then seeded it and then rolled it. Yeah, so yeah, which it does because we lift them up and you turn the soil over and you drive over it and um yeah. Okay, thank you, Neem. Yeah. All right, our last presentation is uh, Jody from the Hallmark Growers Association. So she's going to give an update 
and then run a little workshop with you guys for the next sort of 45 minutes. So um, I'll let Jody take it away. Maybe 45 minutes. Okay, I know I'm the last and everybody wants to leave, but I got Charlie smiling up front and I'm sure he wants to tell me a joke at the end of all this. Um, for those that don't know, know me, I'm Jody Mott and I'm the Executive Director of the Holland Marsh Growers Association. I represent the farmers here in the marsh, federally, provincially, and municipally. I see a lot of friendly faces in here. Um, for those of you that don't know what we do, anytime there's red tape, our farmers are facing issues, they call us or they reach out to some of the people that are on my board. We are a nine-man volunteer board uh, that help represent issues that you guys are facing every day, depending on what it looks like. Um, over the past year, oh, actually, you know what? Since we've, since we've been out of in-person, uh, we've been busier than ever between, I know the word everybody hates is COVID. I gotta let you know, COVID issues are still around. I just dealt with three of them this morning. Sorry, guys. Um, make sure that when you're putting your housing up, that you've got your signs in that you, so you passed your uh, signage there. If you don't have a COVID sign up for your workers knowing, even if you don't have people sleeping there, but working in the building, if you have these signs, you should be staying home. Make sure you do your due diligence. It's falling on you guys. I know Tim, you're gonna give me a look. I can feel it coming. Um, but there's all sorts of different pieces of that that we're looking at as well. So from between COVID, uh, red tape, uh, the different bills that are coming out. It, it's been a busy year. Right now, you're going to see Scott Davidson, RMP. If you see him around, please thank him. He's been working with the association as well as OFVGA, which is Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Growers of uh, Ontario, and uh, FBGC, which is now was the old CHC, which is Fetch, Vegetable Growers of Canada, and CPMA. There is a bill on the table to protect you guys. Everybody wanted the deemed trust. Um, Bill C-23 is coming, or not, sorry, Bill 280 is coming forward, and he will be reading it on April 19th. It'll have its second reading. What this means is if we can get it through there and get it back to the egg people, um, they will, and their part, if it does proceed, you guys will have a protection plan in place that if Charlie sells to me and I go out of business tomorrow, you have access to the cash. Yes, the banks don't like what we're doing, but we've been pushing hard and lobbying throughout Canada. Some of you have already signed letters about this. If you haven't, please see me and we'll get you a letter signed. It's very important for the letter of support for Scott. Um, this is a big win if we can get it through. They're also trying to get it through before the election. So that's another big piece of the puzzle. So we'll see what that looks like. Um, as you've heard through Ontario, C23, that's why I mentioned it before, is a big buzz that's changing things. Some of the farmers might not agree with it, but there's also pieces that um, our colleagues from OFVGA and OFA have gone back and said, okay, so what does that got for farmers? So it might be a little bit easier for you guys to navigate some of the red tape and the pieces that we're looking at there. The main reason why I'm here today is to talk about our AMAFR project. But before I get into any of that, because you guys have already just sat through our AGM, is there any questions for me of any problems that you guys are seeing or anything that I should address before I go into my uh, project that we're here for today? I like this. Okay, so we were very, very fortunate to work with Chris Duke and the AMAFR staff to get our funding uh, for our new project through the... Uh, Bear with me, Lake Simcoe Watershed Funding. There's five pillars to this project and it will be completed by March, 2024. Charlie Lalone is our project manager who's worked with us previously and he's really great about being boots on the ground and everybody's familiar with him so people would like to be involved. There are five pillars to our project. Our project. One is information gathering for vegetable for our credited um, development. Uh, we have uh, a gentleman from the University of Guelph, Coquelin, are you in the room? There he is. He's going to be bugging you guys. If you hear Coquelin, he's coming from me, guys. So please participate. He's actually taking all the phosphorus research papers, all the different things that we've had, and he's actually going to go through it and look and see. Uh, one shop stop based parking is what we've requested for all the stuff that's been out there. So when we hear, oh, well, we already did that study, we know what it looks like, what it is, and actually give us real results and what we're actually doing. They're also going to be doing working on um, some testing and teaching some farmers how to use some probes. And basically, so you can test on your farm, what kind of phosphorus you have, the levels you have, and what that looks like. 
Um, so you can basically, when your consultants, if there's consultants in the room that are selling phosphorus, I'm really sorry, but you'll know what you have and it's training for you as well. So we've got those two pieces of the puzzle. Cocalan needs a few more people and I have given him a list and we'll be reaching out to get a few more participants on that. Uh, the second piece we've actually are pleased that we're working is called Soil Health for Organic Soils and Mary Ruth McDonald, as we all love and enjoy from this research station, uh, has been taking samples and she's doing her project on that and she's got her student and so she'll be reaching out to some of you to see what that looks like because she may need some more samples as she works along her plan for that. The third one is our um, plastics waste collection. And Mary, who's sitting beside Charlie today, will be reaching out to some of you. They're basically looking at all the plastics that we use and how it can be recycled and how we can become more environmental. We know we, the government has lobbied this. We know that you guys are all stewards of the land, want to reuse, reuse, but you also don't want to spend money. So they're looking at different pieces of um, what that looks like. And she'll be working with uh, John, who you guys have seen, Van <sighs> Vanders. Thank you, Vanderbeck. And he, the two of them will be in and around working on that as well. So some of you might be received for that. Uh, the fourth one is robotic trials. We have two trials. Um, we've been working with Joe Chapman um, and another farm that we are uh, still to see to try a laser and another technology, which Charlie's working through that piece now. As you guys know, you've all want to see how technology works, if it works. And we all know that if it works in your soil, it works anywhere. So that's what we're working on that piece. And we'll be reaching out to you to let everybody know the trial dates, where they are, how you can see it, if you have any questions. If there's a technology out there that we haven't tried, I know Mary Ruth has some stuff too, and there is a robotics group as well. Um, Cause I know you guys all do your research and all have all different inputs on it. So if there's something out there that we're not looking at or the robotic look and Chuck's not looking at, we'll basically reach out and see what we can do with that as well. The fifth one is irrigation water quality improvement. So uh, John Vanderbeck is working on that. We had Econ's last project have a little, he's got a contraption that goes at the end of the irrigation pump. You bring it through and it takes out some coliforms and some other pieces. So they're looking on some pieces to that, to the next steps on that part as well. So as you can see, everything that we are doing is basically, as you guys are stewards of the land, improving your quality, making stuff easier for you, and being ahead of what does this look like and what could be coming down. The piece of it, I've been working um, for a bit on different pieces of what this looks like. Eventually, as our own Dennis has always talked about, that we may look at a four, there may be a four R program for certified program and we've been working back and forth and with Dennis and Chris and this information that we're getting there could potentially be a four R certified program for farmers and another checkbox for you what that looks like we don't know but we would like to be at the table to make sure that we have input into it as opposed to a program that's designed that everybody goes oh my gosh we've got this again so that those are the pieces of that puzzle if anybody would like to participate, we do need a few more spaces. We have been reaching out. Please reach out to me and we can get through in this. If you have any ideas, reach out to Charlie and I and see what that looks like as well. Is there any questions at this time? The last thing I'm going to hit on is food safety. I know everybody loves it. Everybody hates it. I think I can do it in my sleep now. Uh, we all know it's here. It's here to stay. There's some pretty good tools out there. Some of the farmers in this room can tell you. We have worked with ProVision. Uh, if you want electronic versions to make it easier, keeps you up to date, they are there. If you're having problems with your food safety, please let me know. I know we had 29 guys th go through audits last year. They will continuing. Make sure you keep your food safety papers up. So if you haven't done your washroom check since the time you harvested to now, and they call you in three days, make sure because you could get a surprise audit. Well, the surprise audit is they'll call you and tell you they're here in a couple of days. That's your surprise audit. If they do show up in the farm, you can say the person doing food safety is not here today. Make sure it's not you doing that purse and uh, they can come back on another day. You're allowed to do that once, maybe twice at the most. You can also be sick that day. Somebody was actually sick two weeks ago. Um, so those are the pieces to get through those. So there's always different ways and we're always willing to work with you guys on that as well. And everybody's got my phone number because I know everybody's got me on speed dial in this room. Is there any other questions? And oh, I'd like you to introduce our new chair. Sorry, Tim. I have a question. If you're not a member of the Road Association, can you still ask for assistance with food safety? 
at this point, if you call me and request that you would like some help, I, my answer is once you purchase your membership through either seeing Matt or myself, then I can help you. The Growers Association uh, four years ago uh, had said that my direction is to help only those that are members. Through COVID, we did reach out and help as in good faith with issues due to COVID. I do, if there's a major crisis of COVID, I can help with that. But if it's if you're not a member and you're requesting our services and assistance, you do have to be a paid member. That's a good question. Is there any other questions? Everybody wants to drive home in the wonderful rain and the thunderstorm. I'll turn it back over to Kevin and thank you for having me. All right. Well, I guess that concludes day one. No one has any other questions. We'll see everyone tomorrow, 9.30, coffee, start at 10. All right, thank you.